football poop is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, we're going team by team. I would be very careful about slings. So, am I going to get sued? Are we got legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Pelizzolo, Sam Monson. We are live here on a Monday morning, fixing every team in five minutes. Once again here, Sam. Mm -hmm. Today it's the AFC and the NFC West. The Wests. And then we have one uh, pre-recorded for Wednesday, the Souths. The Souths will wrap it up on Wednesday. Already in the books. Yeah, so hopefully uh, none of that's dated, but that's, uh, that's this week. And uh, today we're off to the Combine, off to Indianapolis, another, another year heading out to Indy. Sunny Indy. Yeah. Which may not be sunny. It's going to be nice this week, I think. 50s and 60s. It's all right. A lot better than the 8 degrees it was that one time when Neil got locked out of the, yeah. the indoors. They moved it back, Got locked right? outside with like no it's jacket. It's not the same. It's, it's, been, it's, it's back a week later. Week. Yeah, yeah. It's a week later. That yeah. week makes a difference in the cold-ass winter of the Midwest. It does. It does. Um, also, we had breaking news overnight. Oh, yeah? Uh, Peter King announced his retirement. Really? The great Peter King. What? Yes. Um, I may have been the first like on his tweet. Just happened to be scrolling. <laughs> yeah. First. That's the trivia question. First. Yeah, yeah. Who was the first like of Peter? No, P- Peter King retiring from uh, from from full time duty. You know, I'm sure he'll. So he's now out. a part time reporter. I don't know. I'm sure he's just gonna like, you know, he's like just gonna like randomly write a story or Emeritus. something like that. Yeah, he'll just yeah. just hang out. But um, yeah, Peter's he's a legend, wow. a legend in the business. Yeah, and uh, that's what he's he's retiring. So Good pour for one him. out for Peter, Good Hall for of Famer, future Hall of Famer. If uh, for I don't know, is he going to go into a Hall of Fame? Is he know. in one yet? Contributor, I'm sure he will. They can put people like Peter in the, the actual Pro Football Hall of Fame. He probably should be. They Excellent. have a they have a an actual contributor, you know, designation like category. Yeah, I, I mean, mean at some point journalists have got to get in there, right? Yeah, Peter's in. It's got to be in first ballot, a ballot. He's on a ballot anyway. Congrats to Peter King, guy that um, he's been a friend of PFF through the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, really good friends with Neil Hornsby, our founder. And so we've interacted with Peter a lot through the years. He's been great. He um, likes to talk baseball with me. Ah, so I see. Yeah, yeah. The actual break, football really breaking news as well. Uh, the franchise tag has been officially applied to T. Higgins. Yes, that is correct. So on our north, our north episode, we uh, we theorized that that would be the play, and it is T. Higgins franchise tagged by Cincinnati. So first order of business. Now we'll see if they still. Uh, Listen to trade op- trade offers. Yeah, well, that, that I up. mean, this was the direction that we all uh, believed this would go. That the only difference potentially between this and Jesse Bates a year ago is, I would imagine T. Higgins would be would draw more interest from teams looking to trade than Jesse Bates did. Yep. So, uh, see how that plays out. Mm-hmm. All right, ready to go? Yep. Before we get to Indy, <coughs> then we're just driving off. Driving to Indianapolis for the week should be great. Okay, let's start. In the AFC West, Denver Broncos. Starting to fix the Denver Broncos. I think it's all going to start with uh, the quarterback situation. What's happening at quarterback for the Denver Broncos? Of course, they're picking at 12, and they're in seemingly that no-man's land as far as picking a quarterback. They've been linked to J.J. McCarthy a bunch or whoever the QB4 is, right? right? If it's a Bo Nix, if it's J.J. McCarthy, if it's Michael Penix, if it's a later draft pick. But clearly, uh, the Russell Wilson era is over. They're going to, you know, officially, I don't know if they can trade him at this point, but they're going to they're gonna move on at some point here. Quarterback has to be first order business for Sean Payton, George Payton, and the Broncos. The Paytons. The Paytons. All Different I know is... Boy, are Denver going to feel stupid when Russell Wilson wins two of the five, the next five Super Bowls, like he says he wants to. The guy's just confident, man. <laughs> he, he is confident. I think two out of yeah. five is reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a fair baseline for a guy that's got, what, one? Yeah. In his career? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I mean, how many quarterbacks have even won two ever? It doesn't... Listen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he says. I just... I'm impressed by that level. It matters a bit. I'm impressed by the level of confidence. Delusion. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I mean, this is a man that doesn't even know where he's playing yet says he, he figures he can win two of the he's next bringing five. bringing the rings two with Two of him. the next five is the goal. He's bringing the rings with you know? him. 
You know, everyone else is like, they, I'm on the, he's on the decline. Russ has, has lost a step. He's like, no, I'm better than ever. It's better than ever. Anyway, what's Denver going to do here, man? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep comparing them a little bit to last year's Raiders in terms of they sort of predetermined the outcome of the quarterback plan without the other side of the equation. They're like, right, we've had enough of this guy. We're moving on from Derek Carr slash Russell Wilson. We're going in a different direction. And everyone is kind of like on the outside, sure, that makes some sense. That's reasonable. You know, mm-hmm. they, they have a level. They, you, you probably can't win a Super Bowl with those guys, or at least your chances are very low. Uh, so what's your plan? Uh, we don't have one yet. We, you know, we're still working on it. And the Raiders, that was a catastrophe last year. They didn't have a plan. They didn't manage to execute any of their plans, whatever they would have been. And they ended up with Jimmy G as their starting quarterback. Uh, Denver, I mean, you could say they maybe are slightly better positioned, but they're picking lower down. They still have Russell Wilson, his contract on the books. Like, they might be even worse positioned than, um, than the Raiders were to get their quarterback. So, I, you know, I, I think... It's entirely understandable to, to decide that they're moving on from Russell Wilson, though the, the way that they did it and how early in the process they did it is perhaps a little bit less easy to uh, defend. But they need to find a quarterback, and I don't know. Are, are they just stuck having to pick one at 12? Uh, probably. Or I mean, getting hyper-aggressive and doing the trade-up thing. I was looking at the trade-up. So but 12 they don't to, have a lot of picks. 12 to 3 is where the 49ers moved, right, from, um, yeah. to go get Trey Lance. Right. And so from 12 to 3, that's where Denver's at 12. Um, they have a normal allotment of picks. They've and that got, cost them two additional first-round picks on top of 12. Yeah. So they don't have a second because of Sean Payton. Right. They have seven total picks. The other tricky part, and I mentioned this for another – team some other time um (laughs) it's probably on the south episode so i will mention this in the future on wednesday they only picked five times last year they have 14 draft picks on the team over the you know they've picked 14 times over the last two years that's not bad but they they haven't had the denver a first round pick either of of the last two seasons and last year had only five total draft picks usually a teams that that don't have you know high picks top 50 picks multiple years in a row that starts to come back to bite that hurts the roster depth so you're already in kind of a roster depth crunch because of previous years because of the Russell Wilson trade so if you want to make another big trade up from say 12 to 3 and give up more future first round picks to secure a Drake May or a Jaden Daniels again there's just other you you have to do so much else on top of that accumulate reaccumulating draft picks hitting in the middle rounds the Rams strategy of not just you know Forget the picks. Go get the you know trade your first rounders. It's forget, forget the picks. Forget that's the that's picks. what that's what, what that means, right? F them picks. I'm sure it is. Forget yeah. them. Forget them picks. I'm sure, that's what it means. But you got to hit on the middle rounds. You got to hit in round three, round four, round five. So it just puts a little bit more pressure. I don't think Denver's in a good position to trade up. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, and they don't. They're not even in a position to do that whole. Well, let's let's grab a guy in the second round, right? If they are passing on a quarterback. In, in the first, they're passing on one until round three, probably. This was the Panthers a couple years ago. Yeah. Where they had pick six and then pick 103 or right. whatever it was. And, and it was like, up. you could pick Kenny Pickett at six or wait. And they ended up spinning 103 into somewhere in the 90s, whatever it was, and they got Matt Corral. Right. Right. So they hedged and Carolina, you know. And that earned them the number one overall pick. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, Denver's in a tough spot. So I think, I think someone's, the more we talk through this, someone's really in play at 12. The J.J. McCarthy hype is, is through the roof. I've heard mixed – I see mixed feelings in, from around the league and from general analysts I mean, about J.J. Is that a realistic strategy for them to essentially pass on a quarterback to deliberately be terrible this year and actually plan to have the number one overall pick in a year's time? I don't know. When, you, when you've – so George Payton in particular, was he predated Sean Payton. Yeah, but that would like – it's a lot t- of the ills of this team would be solved by essentially a full hard reset to get rid of all this, you know, the cap uh, contract situation for Russ to just stink for a year and plan to be in, in place to actually rebuild this thing next year. If we're playing this game from the perspective of what's best for the Denver Broncos, we know we're, we're the owners of the Denver right. Broncos, which is different from we're the Waltons. Yes. From being George Payton. Just money as far as the eye can see. Yeah. Tons, tons of money. Great. Right. I would, I mean, <laughs> 
if that was, I'd be the GM. Just yeah, like Jerry. Yeah, I'd be doing it myself. Right. And we we'd be, we'd 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 win. We'd I wouldn't win. be doing this podcast with you. No. All right, but let's just pretend. Are we doing this from ownership's perspective or George Payton's perspective or Sean Payton's perspective? Well, right? my question would be, so if, if that was, let's say that's somebody's strategy. Somebody wants, somebody looks at this objectively and says, the best thing this team can do is to stink next year, right? Actually go out there deliberately, pass on a quarterback, grab a, you know, a foundational piece at 12, and next year is when we're actually going to fix this Legally, we thing. would never put this strategy in writing for fear of losing draft picks like right. the Dolphins. We would only have this discussion, say, at Prime 47 in Indianapolis in the dark corner of the steakhouse where you could talk and not have it on the record. Sure. Just for, you know. Um, but so if somebody pitches this in a boardroom in Denver somewhere, right, who's the person that balks? Because, like... GM George Payton. Yeah, but if... but Because he's going to... Because he put... He but that's the thing. made so, the big investment for Russell Wilson. If, that failed. Right. This is his last chance. Yeah, but is it? So if ownership... Maybe. If, if Sean Payton and ownership are both on board, then surely, uh, surely George Payton, just by going along with it, is fine. Or is he, like... Is there a recognition that, hey, <laughs> like, the, Sean Payton and the Waltons get together, right? At a country club somewhere, as is their want and say, hey, look, I got an even better plan than this. We're going to stink next year. We're going to pass on a quarterback. We're going to blow this whole thing up. We're going to get the number one overall pick. We're going to reset the roster and the salary cap, right? It'll be a disaster, and that'll put us in prime position to rebuild in a year's time. And we'll have a a ready-made scapegoat because we could fire George and say it's all his fault. If I've learned anything about business through my years, it's that that's the play, right? You, You go right to the boss, scheme a little bit, get on their good side, and that's how you, uh, that's the power play. Because that So way, we're not fixing the Broncos right here. All we're talking about for 10 minutes is, uh, is a little Sean Payton power play. Well, that play. way you can design next year to be the, re- the big rebuild, and you can make it look like it's an accident and somebody else's fault along the way. It's the perfect scheme. Yeah. A uh, question from Drew in the chat is, what if they go get their guy? That has to be a solid move, right? I mean, I'm as just in, of the minds that it's... in you, trade up to three? Yeah. I mean, I mean the same. We've kind of covered that for a couple of different teams already, right? I, I have massive concerns with the idea of trading up from twelve to three to go and get a quarterback because it's probably going to be QB three in this draft. Now, that doesn't mean he isn't QB one on your board, and if that's somehow how it pans out, I don't think you can hate that. Like, if if Trey Lance was the number one quarterback on the Forty ers board, and they were like, which is not the way it worked. I mean, the, they traded so far in advance that they basically, you know, it's not the way it worked. But They may have wanted Mac Jones. Yeah. Like, if we got to pick number three and whoever it is is still on the board, right, and that's when Denver make the move because they're like, holy crap, the best quarterback in the draft is still available at number three. Let's go make it happen. I wouldn't hate that. I think it's still aggressive. And now with the last couple of years with Bryce Young, et cetera, you know, you can you – can, sound a note of caution that hey if we give up so much to go get this guy can we even capably put a team around him and or is it are we self-sabotaging by doing this um if that was the way it worked out i I don't think you can kill the the plan but the chances are it's not going to be the number one quarterback on their board the chances are it's probably two or three at which point trading what's going to end up being the guts of three first round picks to go get the third best quarterback available just in addition to the fact that you don't have the ability to put a roster around him, does not feel like sound strategy. All right. We can go round and round on the QB situation. The other thing I'll bring up here is I wonder if, if Baker Mayfield seem, is a fit, if he doesn't go back to Tampa Bay, if Sean Payton says, yeah, I, I can work with him, right? If Sean Payton says, I can work with Baker Mayfield and wouldn't get the just, most out of him. Wouldn't you just keep Russ if that was where you were? Nah, they're trending in different directions. Are they? Russ had good stats last year. I don't think he played all that well. He played better than he did the year before. There which is means something he's trending that, upwards, which Sean, is the same as Baker. I will say, like, if you just look at Russ's production and his stats, and you didn't watch the games, you could say, well, Sean Payton elevated another quarterback. He took a guy, and that he did. Was, even if you watch the games, he elevated. It. He was better. Yeah, right. I mean, he definitely was better. Um, the the thing is, when you're in the division with the Chiefs, and now with uh, Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers and, and Justin Herbert, the reason why. Denver might have to make this aggressive move is because how, how are you going to compete? How are you going to compete? And but at that, some point, yeah. the, what the Raiders should have done a couple years ago, as we said, 
if you're going to move on from Derek Carr, it should have been probably two years ago, and you, and you just have to go get the next guy that can compete with Mahomes and the Chiefs. Which isn't Baker. No, I know that. I'm just, this is like two different ideas rolled into one. Would they want Baker or would they literally want that big reset? My problem is the organizational structure might not I can't see an argument lend for, itself to that. I, I can't see a good case for moving on from Ross to replace him with Baker. Okay. So let's say they're going <clears> to, <throat> for the sake of time, we're going to draft somebody at 12. So we're just grabbing QB4. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Like, I mean, either way, a shot has to be taken on a quarterback. What a chance if, has to be taken. I mean, what happens if they're gone? Like we we're quite we're very likely in a situation where QBs go at least one two maybe one two three and then anybody ahead of you needs a QB or trades ahead of you to get a QB you're out of luck. Maybe free agents. I mean, maybe the the way things fall is is what dictates your potential tank strategy. Like you signed Jacoby Brissett. I mean, this is what the Raiders did. This is exactly what the Raiders did. They were like, well, let's... But they tried. Look, the Raiders tried to do different things, right? They tried to trade up. They talked about going to... They had these same conversations we're having. what I'm saying is... They just failed at it. I don't think they chose to. They just didn't get there. Right. But that's Not what, everybody can go get the quarterback. That's exactly what we just described. Denver is kind of stuck at 12. They don't want to trade up to three because that would be vaguely suicidal. So they're kind of going to let the board fall as it may. And if it falls in that way... They end up like the Raiders, where they have no solution. This is an awful place to be. Yeah. Um, I do wonder. I mean, I'm sure people criticize us, and I don't know if that's where the question was, where we always say, go get the quarterback, go get the quarterback. But, yeah, like if you, if it doesn't work out, I mean, I don't hate the Russell Wilson move a couple of years ago. Maybe the restructure of the contract and like right. tying yourself to him. Um, that's where the touchy-feely stuff, I think, needs to go away. Right? Like, just keep proving it. Like the the Packers did a great job with Jordan Love. We'll give you I'll give you a little bit so you're confident, but we're not going to invest in you. We're not going to give you this long term deal till you prove it. That was where they screwed up. Well, so is the Packers Jordan Love strategy actually the answer? Let's draft a quarterback lower down that we believe can sit, actually sit for a year, maybe longer, and then. Next year, we already have our quarterback, and we probably stink because we have to start. Yeah, draft two terrible. quarterbacks. Draft. Draft uh, J.J. McCarthy and then Spencer Rattler in the third if he's available. Well, that's Because you saying. need to find somebody. Now, the rest of the roster doesn't matter. You're going to win six games until you find a quarterback. Max. Um, that's what I'm saying. Maybe Spencer Rattler is the play. Like, and not even J.J. Like, J.J. Let's say J.J. Let's say J.J. McCarthy is gone at 12, right? Atlanta picked him. Whoever. The Giants picked him. Somebody has taken J.J. McCarthy. All four quarterbacks are off the board before 12 rolls around. At 12, you pick whatever, the best defender off the board. You grab Spencer Rattler in the third round, and you're going to have to start this year with some bad quarterback that you don't love. Jacoby Brissett. Drew Locke coming back. I think Brissett's still on the the roster, right? He's listed on our free agent board. Oh, really? So our free agent board, sometimes Brad takes a little poetic license and anticipates cuts. Right. So I don't know if that's part of it, but I'm seeing Jacoby Brissett on our board here. Okay. Okay. I don't I, think you talk, want to start him. Copy-paste anyway. that conversation and just insert Raiders for Broncos. It's the same conversation for the Raiders. This year? Yes. When we talk about them in an hour, when we get to them. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's the same conversation, isn't it? I mean, it's vaguely, yeah. They're one pick apart. The difference is the Raiders have an Aiden O'Connell that theoretically showed a little something and... And they've already done this dance. And they have done this dance. All right, the rest of the Denver roster. (laughs) Uh, Biggest free agents probably Josie Jewell, a linebacker. They are being talked about as a team that could trade Patrick Sertan the second. Would you do that? Um, Unless it it helped facilitate getting me a quarterback, I would not. I think he's one of the most valuable non-QBs in the league right now. I mean, even when you pay him, it it could either help facilitate that deal, right? Twelve to three instead of a first round pick, you're giving up Sertan. Um, it could also potentially mesh with if if your country club meeting aligned on let's stink this year and be better in the future. It might also make sense to trade him away now and stockpile. Yeah, I guess I guess the thing I'm struggling with is knowing that Sean Payton's the head coach, got paid a ton of money, and I'm 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 picturing him coming from Nolans. As impatient, right? And yeah. George Payton in, in this like crossroads in his career is being impatient. So I'm having a tough time reconciling 
the motivation of the decision makers here with what's best for the Broncos. If you're telling me what's best for the Broncos, what the Dolphins did a couple of years ago, remember when the Dolphins always had two or three first round picks for like a three year stretch? Right. The Eagles went through that where they had two first round picks and they kept flipping them. They just kept uh, multiplying those assets. That would be the other play. If you could show patience and copy and paste this for the Raiders as well. If you can show patience and continue to flip your first round picks into the future and have two and then have three and have two and have three, that's the other play that I would be completely in for if we're talking about doing what's best for the Broncos. Which is like the opposite of the way the Saints behaved. Complete opposite. That's why <laughs> That's why I'm having a tough time saying, oh, yeah, that's something Sean right. Payton would do. But I do – so it's weird because I think you're right that Sean Payton generally, character-wise, is more of the impatient variety of human than the other way. Um, on the other hand, because of how they acquired him, right, traded for him, in theory he's the guy that's going to put this all back together – endless money from the Waltons, you know, and therefore sort of endless financial patience. It feels like he's got um, more security than basically probably any coach in the NFL at this point, right, other than like Andy Reid. But like Sean Payton, like if he showed up to the country club and said, this is the plan, right, we are going to stink this year, I'm sorry, but that's the best way of fixing this team, I feel like the ownership would buy it. Yeah, I mean, if... Because what are they going to do? Go, no, sorry, you need to win, like, eight games this year, otherwise we fire you. A complete reset is the way to go. I mean, even from a cap space perspective, it's not like they're not, not going to be massive players in free agency. Last year they were. Remember, they went out and got Mike McGlinchey, and they got Ben Powers, and they uh, they got Zach Allen. They, they, they were big players in free agency. Those are... That's a lot of money just to find some solid starters, right, in Ben Powers, McGlinchey, and, and Allen. Cap space-wise, they're not in a great spot. No. So... I, I mean, look, if they had a new GM and a new head coach, right, and it was like, oh, of course, this is a new regime. They, they could be patient. Right. They would start from – they would say, let's reset this Instead, thing. They have let's start flipping picks into the future, and yeah. let's, let's reset the cap situation. Instead, I think that's what they should do. an incumbent GM and a head coach who just doesn't tend to operate that way, who they paid a lot to go and get. Yeah. So what does that result in? I think – I mean, I think fixing the, the Broncos, if we were running it, we would advocate a complete and total hard reset this year. Yes. And not chasing a quarterback. I think the, um, I think the Raiders are in a similar boat, again, when we get there. Is, Except they, they should have done it a year ago. Yeah. They're going to think they're closer. We're going to talk about the Raiders in a minute. I don't have much. Like, what else do we want to talk about with Denver? The Sertan thing is interesting because if we do a hard reset, I still think he's a part of the core. I mean, you he know, could be, absolutely. Unless you're getting um, – if I was in Carolina a couple years ago and I had Brian Burns, I don't want Brian Burns on that big second contract. I would have flipped him for the two firsts if that was really on the table. Yeah. If Sertan was offered – if I got two firsts yes. for Sertan, which I think he's better and more valuable than Burns, I would, I would consider that. But yeah. Sertan's part of my future. I'm good with locking him up. But if I could get – Two first to help facilitate that, then yeah, I would. I would. Do I mean, it. I think that's the thing. You are at the minimum. You are you are listening to the phone calls on Sertan. Jalen not, Ramsey type deal, like is he? Yeah. He doesn't have the same hype as Jalen Ramsey, but he is good. Right. He's like very you're good. not you're not actively shopping Patrick Sertan, but you're listening to offers at this point. So yeah. our our plan is complete and total reset, yeah. rebuild, punt on quarterback this year. We'll draft Spencer Rattler in the third round. We're not planning on playing him We're this year. Yeah. Spencer Rattler will be riding the bench and developing Jordan Love style. Um, and then hopefully next year he's got something. Uh, and if somebody wants to blow us away with a crazy offer for Patrick Sertan, we'll take it. But I like it. So that's good. Otherwise, we're looking to lock him up long term. Sometimes I like these as just we're, we're having the conversations that I think they're probably having. And that in a, in a very condensed form here, we're right. having it. But we're trying to have those conversations with all these options on the table. What's the best one? And that deal absolutely starts with multiple first round picks. Like yeah, if not, one then first round pick doesn't get yeah, it done. If not, I'll pay him the 20 million and. They'd yeah. be happy with a lockdown corner. Right. All right, Broncos fixed. Is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term, life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. 
You go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. That's meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFFNFL. Policy is issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company. Not available in turn states. Price is subject to underwriting and health questions. All right. On to the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, the title of this is Fixing Every Team in Five Minutes. Mm. So let's start by acknowledging that the back-to-back defending Super Bowl champions are working from a position of power, and they're in a good spot. Yeah, this should be quite easy. Yeah. So the word fixing is really just, hey, what should they do going forward here? Um, two biggest decisions here for Kansas City. By the way, the cap, the cap increase, I was joking the other day, that the cap increase that came out on Friday. Oh, oh every team helps. It helps every team because they, they have more money available. But the Chiefs also get helped, maybe more than anybody, because the, the more the cap goes up, the more Patrick Mahomes looks like a, a steal. Um, and even though I think they've agreed to, to, to do him a solid, right? They've, they've agreed to like up his money as other quarterback money goes up so that it doesn't look ridiculous, so that he's not being paid like QB 12 right. in a couple of years. But either way... The cap going way up, I think, helps Kansas City. They already have all this flexibility with, with, with Mahomes. Their big decision this offseason, Chris Jones, Legereus Need, two of the best free agents on the market. Where do they start? Is are, what, what are they doing with those two guys? Yeah, um, I mean, I think they would like to bring both of them back, but the first order of business is you've got one franchise tag and two players hitting the market. If you don't get a deal done before then, which guy are you putting the tag on? I don't think they can tag Chris Jones at this point. You don't think they can? Just with all the, you know, he missed the first game last year. He's trying to hold out. I just, it feels like the relationship, unless he's just like, hey, man, we're winning Super Bowls. I don't care. The relationship feels like it's beyond let's play the tag game. It would cost. either lock him up or let him walk. I mean, I think that, I don't know if it's the relationship thing. I think it's more the, the money. Like the franchise tag for Jones, given what happened a year ago is around 32 million dollars so you're yeah. making chris jones for one year that making the second would that making the, the highest paid non-quarterback in the nfl must right has to be up isn't donald's getting up there his close, yeah. but yeah has to be right so yeah i would i don't know is jones anything beyond a three-year deal for you at this point i think he's still got plenty left in the tank for about three years and my, my question in, in the, the teams that always have the high-paid quarterback, you have room for three or four other, say, 15 to $20 million players. This is my question every single year. Who are those guys? Because in the, early in the Mahomes era, one of those guys was Frank Clark. And it was like, all right, we need to move on from this contract. We're not getting that out of them. At the moment, one of those guys is Jawan Taylor at right tackle. Right. I didn't love that last year at this time. Again... The Chiefs are similar to, I mean, they're, we're talking dynasty, right? They're similar to the dynasty Patriots where you can make mistakes and still get away with it. I think the Chiefs got away with a mistake well, you can make on mistakes. Juwan Taylor last yeah. year. You can make mistakes and still get away with them, but the higher the dollar figure attached to the mistake, the bigger a problem it is. So, I mean, they last offseason, they effectively voluntarily chose to flip both their tackles for something different, right? They yeah. let... Orlando Brown walk instead of giving him money. And by the way, he was looking for less money than Juwan Taylor ended up getting. So they let Orlando Brown walk. Now, Brown didn't have a good season for Cincinnati. So you can look at that in one way and say that made sense. Bringing in Juwan Taylor as the solution went very badly. Uh, He was a penalty machine. He wasn't, I mean, he's, he's always been a bad run blocker. And he wasn't a particularly good pass blocker either. Once, I don't know if, it was as a product of penalties becoming a thing and officials getting in his head and suddenly now he can't cheat the snap and he's got to, like, everything went to hell. Yeah. So that was bad. And then Donovan Smith being brought in as a sort of last minute. Because remember, the other thing is, when they first signed uh, Juwan Taylor, they were giving all this talk about he's going to play left tackle now. He's going to move to the other side of the line where he's never played, play left tackle, uh, we'll figure out something at right tackle, and then... Close to the season, they bring in Donovan Smith. Smith's going to play left tackle. Juwan Taylor will stay where he he always plays at right tackle. Neither one of those guys was good. So they have at least, they have one big contract, Juwan Taylor, on that side of the line. And the other side of the line is kind of a liability as well. Either way, they're paying a reasonable amount of money now for two pretty bad tackles. Yeah. That's not good. 
Now, it, it's it's obviously not insurmountable. They just won the Super Bowl. But it's a problem. Hold on. For who? They're paying for Juwan Taylor, but not Donovan Smith's a free agent again. Right. They got him for nothing. But they have one spot where they're paying yeah. big money, and the other spot doesn't exist yet. Yeah. And then when we're anticipating the future, Creed Humphrey – is going to have to get paid soon. Joe Tooney at guard is already making a lot of money. He's got a couple couple years left on his contract. But I do think the Chiefs have learned. You know, look, they, they reset after that Super Bowl loss and said never again on the offensive line. We're going to invest properly there through the draft and through um, paying, right? Paying for the right guys. And they've done that. So left ta- they have to figure out left tackle again. They've. It's interesting that they've treated left tackle as like, we'll, we'll trade for Orlando Brown. We'll tag him for a year. We'll bring in a Donovan Smith on the cheap for one year. They've kind of used left tackle the way right tackle has been historically for teams. Like, you just kind of, you know, stitch it together. So I'm curious if this year in the draft, I know everybody's talking about receiver for the Chiefs. If they want to get younger at tackle, I know they drafted Wanye Morris in the third round. I'm just not a huge fan of Wanye. It's like one thing we may have overlooked was the struggles that the Chiefs had offensively at the end of the season, including against the Raiders was when Wanye Morris was out there. The rookie left tackle. I don't know if he's the guy that they're expecting to take over, but that tackle's a place that they have to figure out. And then going back to like who the two price, high priced guys are, are you good with the future of the Chiefs era here being Chris Jones and Legarius Sneed? Can you tag well, Sneed for a year, lock up Jones for three years, and then tag Sneed? Ex- yeah, so it and has they're to, two of your high priced guys. The problem forward. is it has to go the other way around, right? You have to put the franchise tag on Legarius Sneed. That gives you a it gives you time right you, you buy time you've got them locked up for a year you'll work on a long-term deal and or let them play it out and leave next year uh, and get the comp pick but that then means that you are probably exposing chris jones to the open market because at this point when he's he's fought so hard to get paid why would he then sign a deal with you 48 hours before you know the before he's actually exposed to other offers. So you put the franchise tag on Snead. I think that's right. Now you've got to desperately try and get that deal done with Chris Jones, and it's not in his interest to do it for you before somebody else can give him an offer. So now you're battling against the marketplace for a deal on Chris Jones, where, and he is so important to everything that defense has been doing. I can't imagine there isn't another team that's willing to pay him what you weren't willing to pay him a year ago. So... That's a struggle. I, th- I think you try and get him done uh, with a deal because he's so important to that defense, but it's getting costly. <sighs> Third most valuable interior defensive lineman in 2021, number one in 2022, second last year in 2023. Chris Jones, obviously, dominant player. Um, put, he'll be 30, 30 years old by the start of next year. He's, I, I think he's at that point where you feel pretty good about the next three or four years with Jones, right? Yeah. Um, I want, are the Chiefs at this point, too, where you'll get some kind of hometown discounts? You'll get the we want to win a championship discount that all the great teams seem to have? I mean, maybe if you hadn't messed them around last year with money. But yeah. given that you did, I again, I, just because it's so close to the start of the, the league year in the open marketplace, I feel – why would he sign the deal? I mean, yeah – the winning the championships thing also feels like it has more draw when you've only got like if you haven't had one yet or if you've only got one ring. It goes it goes both ways, right? Because sometimes people use the championships to go get go get their money. Right. right? Chris Jones goes to the Panthers and but he's like, like that, I don't care, I'm gonna make thirty five million a year, they're gonna give it to me, I'll do, yeah, I'll go anywhere. It doesn't that, matter. It feels like that's more of a selling point for somebody that is yet to get to the Super Bowl, you yeah. know, is chasing a ring or has you know, has never won one or has only won one and wants extra validation for somebody that's already got multiple rings. Is it that much of a selling point? Hey, come win some more. I mean, sure, but I also want the hundred million dollars. So the other the other underrated aspect of this, Andy Reid's about to get paid and re-up his contract he's coming back they have spags for whatever reason spags is not getting um, head coach consideration and beca- in part because when he was a head coach of the rams it did not go well could also be because he just has no interest he might not have interest i don't know but he but the the chiefs have they're in this great spot where think about what's happening to every shanahan coaching staff or related they're getting plucked left and right the chiefs are not necessarily getting plucked they have some of their foundational pieces in place and n- my normal team building strategy of you know get your receivers get your playmakers obviously the chiefs have decided have decided that you know to move on from tyree kill 
And then, by the way, we're going to win two championships after that. I assume they're going to continue down that path of not having to go crazy at receiver and tight end. But you do have to, you do want to future proof this roster without a Travis Kelsey. So I think that's the other place. If the Chiefs hadn't won the title this year, you know they would have come into the offseason absolutely saying, okay, receiver, 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 right. we've got to do it. Are they still going to do that, right? Or are they like, man, we can win with anything? We won with defense. And then the offense was very good on the playoff run. We could just be good when we need to be. No, I no think matter they, who's there. I mean, I think they still should be acutely aware that receiver is a problem for them. But I think it's a very reasonably easily solved one. Like, the other way that this team is, is quite like the dynastic Patriots group teams is – the more you look at it, the more you're like, yeah, there's a lot of holes here. <laughs> like, it's just that they, they're – because they're so good at the most important ones, it doesn't matter. Like, you look at this team, you're like, they have real problems at offensive tackle. They have only Rasheed Rice in terms of useful contributing receivers. Um, and they're losing two of their most important defensive players unless they re-up them both for big money. These are major problems for a franchise, and yet they can probably ride through – Maybe all of them. Like, the only one that's new in relative to last season is the defensive players thing. Like, yeah. the receivers were still bad last year. They won a Super Bowl. The offensive tackles were not good last year, and they won a Super Bowl. So, I, I, and I think in our order of business, we tag Legereus Need. We desperately try and get a deal done with Chris Jones before the, thing, the, the open market. If we have to bid against other people fine we still try and bring him back and hope the bidding doesn't go insane and we have to walk away because that presents a problem and then you turn to who's our starting left tackle and then receiver i feel like is the easiest one we just draft one yeah pick number 31 perfect spot for a wide receiver in this draft 32 they're super bowl champs 32 sorry and no one lost their first rounder this year 32 Sorry um, to correct you on air. No, you're, you're fine. You're right. You're right. Uh, Troy it's, Franklin. It's important Troy, to, to give correct information, not yeah, misinformation. That is, that is true. Um, Troy Franklin, man. Yes. Oregon receiver Troy Franklin. I love Troy Franklin. Yes. He is so good, and he would be perfect for them. That's the play. I think they're in an interesting spot because I, I think uh, at, at tackle, I don't know if they want to go in next year with Wanya Morris. But both tackle and receiver, we've said this for a bunch of teams. There, there's a lot of teams deba- debating between a tackle and a receiver. There are talented tackles available late first, early second as well. Um, Jordan Morgan from Arizona, Patrick Paul from Houston. I mean, there are potential options there for tackle, either position. Tackle for them is going to be a really interesting decision this offseason. Obviously, they're going to continue with um, Juwan Taylor, a right tackle. They paid him the money. They're, they're stuck with him even if they wanted to get rid of him. Uh, but left tackle is a total – it's open for business. Like, anybody can have that spot. Now, yeah. do they – since that that Super Bowl against Tampa Bay, they've made this real push to invest heavily in the offensive line. On the other hand, Donovan Smith was their starting left tackle last year. You know, sort of last, last minute, hey, what about him? So what do they try and do? Like, do they draft a guy in the first round? Do they try and free up, you know – big money and get whatever the, the sort of biggest name on the market like do they go do they give tyron smith like one last go around and say hey you know let's give tyron smith 15 20 million dollars a year for two years to try and lock this spot down or do they go bargain basement shopping again and bring in a reclamation project like mckay beckton could Mackay Becton be left tackle for the Chiefs for a year? I mean, if the other four sp- spots are solid, and I think Juwan Taylor probably has a better season than he did this year. But By the way, the smartest was answer to all of that is Josh Jones with everybody. Josh Jones with everybody, Josh for Jones sure. for like $6 million yeah. a year to start at left tackle and be better than the guy they've had for the last year? The Chiefs also, I mentioned before, but Creed Humphrey, <laughs> last year of his deal. Trey Smith, last year of his deal. In the Part of the Chiefs overhaul was not just, hey, we invested in Joe Tooney, we're paying for these guys. We also hit on a second rounder in Creed and a sixth rounder in Trey Smith. Yeah. So those guys have to get paid. So there's a chance if they do pay both of those guys, we're talking over 10 million, 10 to 15 million for four out of five starters already. So they might have to stay cheap at left tackle for this year, anticipating the future. Or at least um, plan it so that next year is cheap. Like yeah, yeah. This for year, sure. they, could, they could spend this year. They could do a year if they. Yeah. 
Yes. It's just, it's a case of like, you know, plotting out when the money is going to hit for various spots. But like Tyron Smith this year, you could stru- even if it was a two-year deal, you could structure that deal so that the big money hits this year, next year frees up and it's cheaper and, you know, you can spend that money on Trey Smith and Creed Humphrey or whatever. The one so other spot it. to look at um, where on paper they're losing depth, Chris Jones, as we mentioned, there's, you know, you could lose him. Derek Nottie, mm-hmm. Mike Dana, a couple other defensive linemen need defensive line depth like other teams. So just something else to keep an eye on. They've invested – Two first-rounders at edge over the last couple of years, George Karloftis, FAU, and DK Zama. But still probably more to do there on the D-line. Do the bargain basement edge defender thing. Certainly, yes, and certainly interior. And interior, I mostly think, interior yeah. that, they, that they need help Whether with. Whether or not Chris Jones leaves. To Vondre Sweat for all the teams that might need a two-down run, run stopper. A 400-pound monster. All right. Do we fix the Chiefs? Yeah. Good thing. It was more more involved than we thought when you talk about the Super Bowl champions. I mean, everybody's got decisions and everything to be made. It's like but they got but, quite a lot, and they're fairly significant ones. Oh, no, they have a lot of yeah. The thing again, the thing with the Chiefs is they're starting with that higher baseline where the you know the, if they make a couple bad decisions, maybe they only make the AFC Championship. If they make good decisions, you know, they might become unstoppable, might <laughs> even more than they are now. Uh, All right. Would you bring in any? Would you mentioned Tyler Boyd for them before I think did oh yeah I did accidentally other, mention that other uh, veteran free agent receivers as opposed to just drafting a guy like Troy Franklin uh where's my list I think man if they brought in Tyler Boyd and Troy Franklin Tyler Boyd would be huge don't they also feel like the kind of team like I, this is going to be slightly revisionist given what we've just seen <laughs> as evidence that this is not the case but theoretically Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs offense is still like a dream landing spot for basically any veteran receiver in the NFL. And you, you imagine that they can boost pretty much any receiver in the NFL. A guy like K.J. Osborne has shown he can be a really useful receiver as a three in the league in a worse offense with a worse quarterback. Like K.J. Osborne being paired with Mahomes feels like something that could work quite well. Oh, I like that. Um, for the money, I, I mean, I wonder, if they got like Darnell Mooney on the cheap, again, I don't want to sign Mooney for like two or three years at twelve million plus, but Brad has a projection of one year nine million. Right, Mooney. If the Chiefs wanted, remember they had no ex- explosiveness this year. Um, Valdez Scantling wasn't catching the ball effectively until the playoffs. If they do want to create some more big plays down the field, which was a big weakness for this Mahomes-led offense, is Darnell Mooney a type of guy? I just don't know if they can afford that with everything else they have going on. Also, Cedric Wilson. Cedric Wilson's just a good wide receiver, and he's buried on the depth chart in Miami. Liberate the man. Send him to Kansas City. Let him play. Send the good receivers to Kansas City, and they'll produce. That's what we said about Sky Moore. Yeah, that didn't work well. Did not. Sky Moore, in fact, is apparently a terrible NFL wide receiver. Chiefs fixed. Las Vegas Raiders. Ah. Copy-paste. Quarterback discussion from the Broncos. What are we doing at quarterback? Aiden O'Connell. Currently the starter. Uh, new GM, Tom Telesco, comes in. New head coach is Antonio Pierce. You're uh, like text buddies with Tom. What does he think you should do? Come Just on, ask you him. You can't give away my... Uh, Contact? Yeah. Because now if I say an NFL GM said, <laughs> people might think it's no, Tom. No, you just need more than one and you're good. Well, I'm going to show Tom the model this week. And mm-hmm. if, they, <clears throat> if he likes the model, maybe I'm going to go work for the Raiders and draft better. In Vegas. You're a real Vegas person. Oh, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. It was great. I love paying airport prices and, you know, real world. Everywhere. Everywhere you go. Um, Yeah. So the Raiders, it's an interesting spot um, because they they overachieved last year, I thought, defensively, right? And from an on-paper standpoint, boy, do they need playmakers on the defensive side of the ball. They got some uh, impressive play from guys like Malcolm Kuntz and you know Max Crosby of course is dominant and Robert Spillane did a great job last year so they they overachieved they did a really nice job they maybe stole Jack Jones if he could yeah. you know, continue to stay out of trouble looked like a really big time playmaker for them down the stretch so maybe the defense isn't as bad as I thought it would be but I would not you know I would continue to add to that side of the ball and that's after we solve the quarterback situation there's definitely a world where that group is actually pretty decent as opposed to this time a year ago you're looking at it you're like this thing this is just no way this is terrible yeah um like jack jones is a legitimate talented playmaker if they can keep him on the straight and narrow nate hobbs is a really good player they put him back in the slot where he belongs chicorian bennett didn't grade particularly well but he's got 
a lot of uh, ability as a young man-to-man type of corner. As you said, Malcolm Coots, uh, Coons, Max Crosby, uh, Trevon Merrick, like Robert Spillane of all people was playing really well, and they love him. Um, he showed flashes in Pittsburgh. But that is like you're starting to put together a core that could actually work long term. Now, you still need to build on it. You know, there's, there's basically nobody on the interior. But, you know, that, they could be something. Yeah. So, I, again, I would, I would continue to add to that side of the ball. Let's start with the, with the QB discussion, though. Um, we talk a lot about taking chances mm-hmm. on quarterbacks and taking as many shots. Like Aiden O'Connell's one of those guys, right, as a – was he fourth round? Yeah. Fourth round pick. You took a shot on him. There's there's something to work with there. He flashed. He flashed. He but did. you can't go into the season with him as the starter. No. I mean, so. Not unless you're, like, deliberately tanking. Right. Which you're not allowed to officially do. This, was, this is what was really interesting about last season where teams, two teams did that, right? Washington with Sam Howell and Atlanta with Desmond Ritter. They took a third, fourth, fifth rounder, right? Third rounder in Ritter, fifth rounder in Howell. And that's not helping uh, Aiden O'Connell's. No, it's not helping the case whatsoever. Yeah, right. But they said, okay, you're, we're invested. We're buying in to yeah. you as our starter. We're giving you a shot. Next year. I mean, we're th- giving those, you a shot. Those we're, players typically don't get that shot. I love seeing that as a, an experiment. It's just kind of unfortunate that yes. both of them went to hell. Um, and, and so I'm not – I'm like – my strategy would be, yeah, draft your Aiden O'Connells every year. Draft your Spencer Rattlers. Draft anybody you can in the third, fourth, fifth round every single year. But you're going you know, to do it next year too, right? You're not going to be like, well, we drafted O'Connell last year. Got to give him a shot. Have to give him a shot. Have to see what he can do. You don't have to. You um, can draft someone else as well. So the Raiders pick at 13. They are right behind the potentially QB desperate Vikings and the QB desperate, as we already laid out, Denver Broncos. So they're in an even worse position. And the Falcons and the Giants. Yeah, yeah, I'm just talking talking about specifically in that range. In addition to the three teams picking one, two, three that all need quarterbacks. There's six or seven teams ahead of them who could be drafting a quarterback. Yes, yes. That that puts them in a very bad position to grab a quarterback. So another team where... Do you say, like, let's show patience. We're in a division with the Chiefs. We're in a division where the Chargers are picking fifth, but, boy, do they have a much better foundation than these other teams do because they have Justin Herbert. So if you're Denver and you're Vegas, when you're, when you're talking to, you know, Mark Davis or whoever, your owners, you're like, hey, the goal is to compete in 25 and 26. We're building a team to compete in a couple of years. If the Raiders, the Raiders were half in, half out a couple of years ago, right? We're going to kind of hedge on Derek Carr. We know we need to rebuild this whole thing. But, oh, we're going to trade for Devontae Adams, too, and try to win now. They were half in, half out. And they're still half in, half out because of that. Are they another team that actually needs a complete reset here? Their problem, I think, is slightly different to Denver's, only in terms of they're even further away from the quarterback option. So if you're... If you're strategizing for the Raiders, I think you have a fair argument to, to just sort of lay out the landscape to ownership and say, where the hell am I getting a quarterback from? Like, even if we want one, what are we doing here? Either you go crazy aggressive and you try and trade up to three, the trade that we talked about for Denver that we didn't love, or you say there's simply no way we're getting a high-quality starting quarterback this offseason, and that's a reality that you need to accept and embrace. So those are your two options. Like, do you trade all the way up to three, if not higher? Uh, or do you accept, like, we can't actually put a starting quarterback on the field. It's, it's O'Connell's this year, and next year we'll try and find a guy. Well, the other difference is the Raiders have a second-round pick that Denver doesn't yeah. have. So the second-round pick, I mean, I'm, I would take a Michael Penix in round two. Do I want him in the top 15? I don't know. And start him, like, right away? Penix and O'Connell, go ahead and compete. Like, like again, the whole the whole point of drafting an Aiden O'Connell in in the fourth round isn't to just give him six or seven starts in year one. It's to actually see if he could develop during the course of his four year contract, right? And it's year two of Aiden O'Connell. Let O'Connell and Penix compete for the starting spot. You get Penix at forty, pick forty four. You pick the best player available at thirteen. Pick Michael Penix at forty four if he's there. I don't know where his stock's going to land, the injury stuff, but say, say Michael Penix, whoever it is. I mean, I think J.J. McCarthy should be going in round two, not in the top 15, too, but I, I don't know what the what scarcity want. is. Right. 
But I would take insert round two quarterback. Bo Nix should probably be going in the second round as well. Again, scarcity issue. But I would take your favorite round two quarterback and say, here, go compete with Aiden O'Connell. And if we got to draft one next year in the first round, we'll do that too if we're, in, if we're better positioned. Yeah, I mean, I think this, just the same as the Raiders. I think that's a better strategy – or the Broncos, rather. I think that's a better strategy than trading to three because of what you have to give up and the fact that you're trading for QB3 most likely or at least, you know, two on your board. So, yeah, I think – I mean, it's a tough sell, the ownership, though. Hey, <laughs> we're the competition this year is Aiden O'Connell versus second round quarterback who's QB five maybe off the board. I mean the whole the whole point of you have to be able to think long term if you're building a team. And there's no veteran option, by the way. Like this is the other shadow over this. Like if assuming they're not in the Kirk Cousins market, which I guess they could be. Uh, after Cousins, you are talking Baker, who we already discussed is not really going to get you where you need to go, particularly in this division, Ryan Tannehill, and then backups like Brissett, Minshew, Winston. Drew in the chat Tyron. again is suggesting Ryan Tannehill in bridge, as a bridge quarterback. I mean, if you're bridging, Only, you might as well just go with Aiden O'Connell. But the point, but you, you bring in Tannehill and you bring in O'Connell and you hope O'Connell wins the job, probably. It's a tough sell to Tannehill, who could be a starter still. Right. But... The point is to allow all the other draft capital to go. It's a cheap quarterback option, probably, like one year, what, $10 million or whatever. And then every other asset's going to the rest of the team. Yeah, I just don't see the point in a quarterback like that. I feel like you're better off doing the Washington thing. I mean, they did it, I guess, with Brissett. But I just – what's the point? If you're, if, you, if you're in the situation where you're that far away – Just roll with O'Connell. Just roll with the guy that's not costing any money and showed flashes last year. Like, why complicate it by giving him veteran competition? Unless you believe there's, like, mentorship value in that. Which, for Tannehill specifically – I think it's a tough sell, given how he reacted when they drafted Will Levis and, uh, and um, the guy the year before that, Malik Willis. Like, Tannehill fairly well set out, like, my job is not mentorship. My job is to play quarterback for this team. Uh, so he doesn't feel like the right type of guy if you want to bring him in to help the young guy along. I just don't see the point in that. Like, if you're in that position, just play Aiden O'Connell and see how it pans out. All right. So quarterback's a challenge. Would they, could they be in the Kirk Cousins market? Hmm. Because if you want I, a, start, a high-caliber starting quarterback, he's the only option as a veteran. I feel like the last year at this time, we were having this discussion about Derek Carr when he was a free agent. And we said, if the Jets signed Derek Carr as a fallback from Aaron Rodgers, that feels horrible. Yes. Because they're competing with a Dolphins team that's going all in and, of course, the Bills. And, but we said when Derek Carr signs with the Saints, it's like, well, all right, now they're the best team in the NFC South. They weren't, but they probably should have been. Um, it feels different. The Cousins thing kind of feels the same to me, where it's like if, you, if, if your answer to Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert in your division is Kirk Cousins, it doesn't feel great, especially not at the price. If your answer in the NFC South is Kirk Cousins, and you're, for the Falcons say, eh, it feels a little bit better. It feels like we could win this division with everything else we have. So that's where I am with the Raiders. That, it just shows the difficulty of, of the whole quarterback dance. Yeah. And, it's not also, that like the, uh, and again, not that like the <coughs> Michael Penix mystery box, the Bo Nix mystery box is better, but it's cheaper and it could be good. And if it's not good, you, you play another mystery box that's still going to be much cheaper, right, yeah. as you're building your roster out. And Cousins at this point is – not probably not. I mean, he's not a long term solution, right? He's 35, 36. He's coming off an Achilles. Yeah. It's not the guarantee that it might have been a couple of years ago. I think he's a better version than what Derek Carr was, but yeah. it's a similar decision of like, oh, yeah, Derek Carr will do it. And he's like, older. Like, it's not necessarily, yeah. you can't even sort of pitch yourself as, hey, Cousins can be the guy for the next five to seven years. It's like, no, Cousins has probably got two in him. And then you're, yeah. you're out of there. I will say the foundation that the Raiders have with Devontae Adams and Jacoby, Jacoby Myers catching the ball. Yeah. Uh, Michael Mayer in year two here. It is a nice foundation that I do think if Cousins was there, you've got a chance to put up an offense, uh, to, to create some offense here. Right. Just like a couple of years ago, Derek Carr should have been in position to, 
you know, put up numbers. But the Josh, whatever reason, the Josh McDaniels offense was not good whatsoever for what the Raiders needed to do. So if we're rolling with uh, Aiden O'Connell, a quarterback, drafting a guy in round two, effectively punting on the position for a year, uh, the Raiders have quite a lot of cap space to spend. One of the biggest moves I think they could make is if and when it reaches the new league year, they should outbid the Chiefs for Chris Jones. That would be something. That's the defensive playmaker I think they need. Now you got Chris Jones. So you got Chris Jones and Max Crosby. It's a lot of money locked up in two guys, but I would like it. It is, but they are, you know, two of the top guys in the NFL at their position. I mean, those are two of the best impact playmakers. It fills the biggest area of need on that che- on that Raiders defense and you steal the best defensive player away from the best team in your division. Does that keep you in that halfway, hey, we're trying to compete right now, but we're still really trying to figure out this quarterback situation? We're not there yet? Yeah, I mean... Because I feel like if, if you go a little bit younger, I mean, there's no one else like Chris Jones on the market, but if you go younger with your free agent signings, get your 26, 27-year-olds so that they're they're peaking two, three years from now. I mean, it's not a long-term solution, but we both said previously like you feel good about the next three years of chris jones yeah. right so there, I, I think there's space for like a spectrum of ages and experiences you know and, and cap lengths or contract lengths rather on the roster yeah like theoretically if you draft a new quarterback next year and he's your guy and then it's going to take a year for him like you're two three years down the road before the raiders are like legit and then maybe you're getting to the end of the chris jones thing but i don't think that that means it's a bad move just because He's not necessarily going to be there in four years' time. Like, they need impact on that defensive line now unless you're legitimately trying to blow it up and start over. And I don't yeah, think I, I, I don't think they're going to try to blow it up. I mean, right. some of the – it's funny. Some of the things Antonio Pierce is already saying scaring me. Like, I'm, against my nature, hate doing this, but, like, just reading quotes, not hearing the context, I'm against this. I mean, Antonio but, Pierce, without hearing or seeing what you're about to say, Antonio Pierce strikes me as the kind of guy who, regardless of situation, will be telling you how they're going to win a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's already hinted at, like, oh, we already figured out the Chiefs type of thing. Like, we already, we already showed we could, you know, whatever. It feels like that's going to be, like, the Chiefs are going to drop 50 next year against the Raiders <laughs> just because he said it type I just, of thing. That's his, I think that's Poking just the his, bear. his, like, attitude or outwardly face. Like, when he was telling you about how he's going to re, you know, build the defense around Robert Spillane and like, you know, it's just the type of person he is. Like it's all, there's no situation that's too, uh, that's too negative for us to paint a positive spin on it. All right. Are we, um, so that's another interesting move. You're saying Chris Jones. I'd go after Chris Jones. I think they have the money to make that happen. It fills a perfect need. It damages the best team in your division and the best team in the conference and the best team in the NFL, it's win-win. To me, it feels like it might be a mismatch of the team team building strategy where we're going to be a little patient at quarterback, but like, if, but maybe impatient on but defense. But in three years' time, let's say, for example, in three years' time, you've got now got a young quarterback on a rookie contract who's a year into his career and clearly looked good, right? Now is the time to deploy the resources around him that's right at the time Chris Jones is now reaching the end of this contract and the money's getting freed up anyway. He's just going in a different direction with it. It's not like it hurts that strategy. Other places that they need to attack, three out of five offensive line starters hitting free agency. Again, last year at this time, didn't look great on paper, but they were solid. Jermaine yeah. Illuminor, who you've liked the last couple of years, hits free agency, played right tackle last year. Greg Van Roten had a career year. Andre James at center. So some holes to plug in there. They've got Colton Miller and Dylan Parham back at left tackle and left guard, but that's it. I mean, I would try and bring back one or two of those guys, Illuminor, Van Roten, either one or both could come back. Um, if not, they're in the shopping market for that. Uh, th- those veteran offensive linemen, of which I think there are quite a few. So um, I'm not – it's work that needs to be done, but I don't think it's insurmountable. Then there's Josh, the Josh Jacobs situation at running back. I know what we would do. Mm. Antonio Pierce as head coach um, with Tom Telesco coming in. Remember, Telesco, I don't want to say played hardball with um, Austin Eckler, but he didn't necessarily give in to Eckler. They signed Eckler to, I think, a very analytically sound, reasonable running back contract, which also 
is probably the same contract that really pisses off running backs. Right? Yeah. So they, um, it was one of those like on paper, this is a really sound move, but it's also one after a year where the dude gets disgruntled for being underpaid. So how do you balance that now with uh, Josh Jacobs? Yeah, this feels like one where what you should do and what they're going to do are completely different answers. Like, I think they're going to want to, I think they're going to pay him whatever, you know, it takes to keep him around. I feel like you just let a guy like that walk. Yeah. I mean, if it's a two year deal and it's reasonable. I mean, I don't think he's signing for an Austin Eckler deal. No, not at like six, seven million, whatever it was, even six like, million. But even, even, but like two years, version. 12 million or something like that. But even like a current version of the Austin Eckler deal, I don't think he's signing for. Like, yeah. I think he, uh, well, uh, he's certainly not signing before testing free agency at that. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay him, but I think if Pierce, if, if, if they do really want to run the ball and, you know, there's there's an argument. Josh Jacobs has been a top three most valuable running back, three to five most valuable running back. Last year wasn't great, but two years ago he was number one in PFF WAR, led the league in rushing, and they did win some games legitimately because of him. But the second contract stuff, obviously, not a great history there for running backs. So, and as we mentioned, every year there's a nice round two to four running back group, and this year's no different. Mm -hmm. So I would get younger there. Uh, pick thirteen. Is there anybody? In particular, remember we talked about the defensive players that could be falling. I think there's a, uh, the cornerback world. Yeah. should They should be very much in the mix there. Cornerback, I think, you might be in a position where you might be picking the bet, the top corner off the board at that point, or certainly like cornerback two, yeah. given what we just talked about, which is, okay, Jack Jones has been really good. On the other hand, he's in Vegas and he has a history of – problems so at the minimum you should probably have a contingency plan there for jack jones nate hobbs is really good he's your slot guy jacorian bennett i think flashed potential but is a second year you know mid to low round corner prospect that you're probably relying on starting this year uh i think they should absolutely try and grab another starter in the draft in in the first round if he's there so if you get to pick take your pick of your favorite corner i think that's perfect all right, have we fixed the Chiefs? I mean the uh, Raiders. Yeah, I the think next, so. the next Chiefs. The next, Chiefs. the next Chiefs, the next powerhouse in the AFC West. We're an hour into the show. We've done three teams. We got it. Perfect. Raiders fixed. Los Angeles Chargers are up next. Wrapping ah, up. Jim. Wrapping up the AFC West. How are we going to fix the Chargers? Justin Herbert. We got him. We got him locked up. We got the QB. Got him. And. Uh, I mean, my question with Greg Roman coming in, what does this offense look like? Roman, as offensive coordinator, has... Wants to run the ball. He wants... They, they want to run the ball. I don't know. He does, historically, but is that because he's had running quarterbacks? No, no, he's already said, like... I know what he said, but last year at this time, Mike McCarthy was saying, I want to run the ball, I'm the head coach and the play caller, I'm going to control the game. Like, Mark, Mike McCarthy said a lot of things... And then come season, they threw the ball more than ever. So I know they say things. Roman has a history, though, yeah. of running the ball. Yeah, he does. And I don't imagine he's going to go away from that. What if this looks like, remember the Russ years of, I think Russ, teams, team, everybody was asking about letting Russ cook because he would have games where he threw 25, 30 times. Mm hmm but he had a ton of big-time throws, high big-time throw percentage because it was a lot of play-action, downfield throwing. If, if, Herbert, if, if we're in this world where Herbert's not drop, dropping back 40, 45 times anymore and it's actually closer to 35, 30, and, he's, and it's play-action, chunk plays, leaning into his arm strength and everything, is that not the worst thing in the world if that's what the offense looks like? I... I don't have a problem with it as a strategy, generally. I think we're still in a world where people are trying to unlock the, the 100th percentile of Justin Herbert, like his optimal ability, his optimal um, efficiency levels of quarterback, and maybe we end up settling in a world that's similar for, but for different reasons to Russ, which is actually what we thought was only 90% of how good he could be might actually have been 100%. Like we already saw the best of what he could do and it, it just might not be as good as everyone thought it was. So 
but I'm still like any and all strategies to try and unlock what we believe is the potent, the full potential of Justin Herbert. I'm fine with, and if that's Greg Roman's offense and the whatever version he crafts around Herbert, I don't have an issue with it just because it involves running the ball some more. If they want to, I mean, if they want to run the ball. I don't know what the offense looks like just because there was so much QB run game in Greg Roman's history. Lamar Jackson, Colin Kaepernick. The, right. Historically, there's, there's a lot. I mean, he's really athletic. I, I mean, Herbert should lot. be used. One of the things that put Herbert on the map was like a 70-yard run as yeah. a freshman at Oregon. I, I get he's fast. But he should and be big used. And strong. Yeah. But he should. <clears throat> he's not playing battering ram QB power guy. Like, remember how you said the Giants just keep throwing Daniel Jones out to the Wolves in the QB run game. Yeah, but part of that is Daniel Jones having, like, zero protective instincts for himself. Yes, but, like, shouldn't use him any more than Daniel Jones was used in the run game. Like, the occasional keeper. No, but that's quite a lot. I mean, Daniel Jones was a pretty instrumental I was part say, of that run game. I was going to say Andy Dalton in the run game back Andy when he was in Dalton. Cincinnati. Yeah, like, Dalton was a, he was a running quarterback, a good running quarterback at TCU. Yeah. And with the Bengals, what, he, he'd keep the ball two or three times a game tops? It just just to keep defensive ends honest, just to keep them honest. But he wasn't running downhill power. No, he was I mean, running zone keeper. You know, if they if they don't respect it, that has to be the extent of it. I think with Herbert. I mean, I think you can use him in the Daniel Jones spectrum, which is actually quite a lot of rushing. Uh, you just probably don't want to use him like Josh Allen because Josh Allen is a singularly unique freak show. Um, but he's like 6'6", 235. Like, he's big. I, okay, he's got some – he's had a very extensive injury history without the running stuff. So maybe you don't want to lean into it too much. But I don't think – like I think you can use him quite a lot, like much more than a statue-like pocket passer. You know, there's – he can be a part of that run game. Um, the big thing for the Chargers, like starting point number one, though, is they have no cap space but quite a lot of obvious cap casualties – yeah. So we need to take the scissors to the roster. Who are you getting rid of? Okay. So uh, the, here are the high price guys on the Chargers right now. I'm just I'm not looking at this year's cap number, but just APY over the course of their current contracts. Mike Williams and Keenan Allen at receiver. Yep. Both just over twenty million. Joey Bosa twenty seven million. Khalil Mack twenty three and a half. Derwin James. Safe in the off season. Wow. You just jinxed him. Nineteen million. It is um, Corey Lindsley, twelve and a half million at center, but they have five non-quarterbacks at nineteen million AAV or APY plus. That is a massive number, and that's why I think we we get caught up and caught up in the names the last couple of years because they had some good names, yeah, right. And I thought they were they were at good positions, right? Two pass rushers, two receivers, and a do-it-all safety. That's why the team building effort with the Chargers, other than like the cap situation that they're in right now, I don't think it's been bad. I think they put a lot of good personnel out there, but clearly these guys aren't sticking around. So yeah, so they are over twenty five million over the salary cap. Do you have the, the Do you have the exa- the the best um, cap savings handy on all those guys? Yeah, I do. Despite the Give fact that the uh, salary cap obviously just moved in their direction, so cap savings for some of the players you just mentioned. We cut Khalil Mack. We get $23 million back on the salary cap. Got to do it. We cut Joey Bosa. We get $14 million back in the salary cap. We cut Keenan Allen. We get $23 million back on the salary cap. We cut Mike Williams. We get $20 million back on the salary cap. We cut Eric Kendricks. We get $6.5 million back on the salary cap. Yes, now, I'm here now, there's too. some fairly significant dead money attached to most of those, but... Though that's a that's a real volume of cap saving if you want to purge any and or all of those guys. I feel like Keenan Allen should stay. Yeah, Mike Williams is the more. most the most obvious. Mike Williams twenty cut. million saving. You get twelve and a half dead cap, but you save twenty million dollars immediately. The Joey Bosa Khalil Mack thing is interesting. I, Khalil Mack graded much better than Bosa. Had had a decent year, but Mack felt like. Um, I don't know. He had the six sacks against the Raiders that one game. He felt like he just kind of dominated some not great tackles yeah, and was not helpful otherwise. Right. Um, despite having a very good grade. I mean, a $23 million cap saving for getting rid of him, I feel like that's pretty obvious. As On well. the other hand, you've got Joey Bosa, who's played fewer than 600 snaps, less than 600 snaps over the last two years. And even when he was out there, people, you know, maybe they – 
Joey Bosa has underachieved a little bit. Nick yeah. has surpassed him as more dominant and more consistent and more healthy. So that's a tough one, man. Because I, I, look, I, Bosa's in what year eight, nine of his career. He's heading to year nine. Joey Bosa, year nine of his career, man. Um, do you get rid of both though, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, and completely reset that position? I mean, now's the time to do it if you're doing it. I think there's an argument for that. I mean, if you got rid of Mack, Bosa, Mike Williams, and Eric Kendricks, right? Yeah. You are saving, what is that, 37, 57, 63, $64 million against your salary cap? And, and then you're, you're, just... only, you're only 25 and a half over at the moment, so you basically freed up 40 million of space. Now you're actually players in free agency if you want to be. Yeah. Completely overhauling the roster. But draft a bunch of Wolverines in the draft. A lot of Michigan players. Yeah. Just get the whole Michigan squad there. I mean, that's going to be interesting too as like the new scheme is, you know, Ravens, Michigan and like the battle for those types of players of which I don't even know what the specific type is. I think versatile linebackers are needed. I don't know if there's – it's not as clear-cut as, you know, like a two-high scheme or the Seattle cover three scheme. It's not as clear-cut as what the style of player is, but you're pursuing the types of, you know, their players. I feel like I feel like Khalil Mack and Mike Williams in particular are no-brainers. I think Joey Bosa, the contract is different. It's a bigger dead cap hit. It's not as much of a saving. You can also free up some space by restructuring him. I feel like you can talk yourself into – He's had a bad injury run. Let's restructure him. Let's try right. and make that work again. And then Keenan Allen, I think, is just too important to the offense to let walk, even though it's a massive saving. So I would keep him around. But I certainly feel like the, the two big names, Khalil Mack and Mike Williams, they're gone. Now, last year at this time, we said what the Chargers really need is speed on, on the offensive side of the ball. Because Mike Williams is not all that fast. He's a contested catch guy. Keenan Allen, not very fast, but a, a – uber possession type and he's awesome at that they did draft Quentin Johnston who's fast doesn't mm -hmm. catch the ball very well um, but you know I always say well, you move move your receivers a peg down the depth chart so let's talk about pick number five number five uh, because Greg Roman has said run the ball as I tweeted out the other day well Joe Walt could be there at five mm. Alt's not your mauling run blocker but I think he's your he's I think still the best all-around run blocker in the in the game. Not going to move people as much as say Fuaga from Oregon State or maybe even J.C. Latham from Alabama, but he loses less, and he's good in the zone game. He could he could run the power game, the downhill power game. Not your best gap blocker, I guess for uh, for Roman, but Joe Walt is still your cleanest tackle. Put him in at right tackle opposite Rayshon Slater. That's if they want to go that route. Yeah. Most Chargers fans though, they want Malik Neighbors. And I am okay with that. I am perfectly fine with Malik Neighbors at five, pairing him with Keenan Allen, at least in the short term here, pushing, putting a little, taking a little pressure off Quentin Johnston, let him be the three, let him just be a, a deep threat or, you know, run the shallow cross that he ran 71 yards against Michigan for a touchdown in the college football playoff. Malik Neighbors at five for the Chargers. That's interesting, actually, how much of an impact uh, – Johnson's performance against Michigan against Michigan has in the eyes of Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, because that, could, that could cover absolutely this guy. affects everybody else, right? Yeah, we couldn't cover this guy right in the college football playoff. That guy's got a new lease of life because the coach had just signed yeah. on, thinks he's God, even because he probably didn't watch him in the NFL last year oh, and just remembers him carving up Michigan. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I so I would definitely go in this particular situation. Would absolutely go. Uh, receiving weapon over offensive lineman at five. The other pick that's being connected to them a lot is Brock Bowers this high. This is like the first potential spot for Brock Bowers for a lot of people. Really? Yeah. I well, they don't have, like, all of their tight ends are free agents, basically, except Parham. Gerald Do Everett's Gerald? hitting free oh, yeah, agency. Oh, yeah, I got it. I Parham is the one the guy staying season. there. They have no receiving threat at tight end without – bringing in a Brock Bowers. I don't know if I'm taking Bowers at five over, certainly not over neighbors, especially because, look, how much Roman uses multiple tight ends mm -hmm. quite a bit. I know he had Mark Andrews too. Mark Andrews, is, is Bowers your Mark Andrews type? Not necessarily the best run blocker, certainly not your in line. We're going to block a defensive end, you know, down block on the six tech type of tight end, but you know he's going to get used. So that part I get. That's fine. I would still probably go receiver first. 
Um, either way, I want I want Herbert with uh, with playmakers, man. Yeah, so. I agree with that. I mean, I, it, it all depends on what you believe Brock Bowers is and how damaging you think the Kyle Pitts experiment has been to him. Um, but we, we've also the reason why we're talking about alt too is because we think they might want to overhaul this entire offensive line, right? They're solid on paper, Zion Johnson at left guard and Corey Lindsley as he gets older. But right tackle's been an issue for a while. Trey Pipkin's there. Are they a, are they another team that's a candidate at 37 on the turn to go to so a receiver at five and then get one of those second round potential tackles? And and now you're now you're starting to move forward on the offensive side of the ball. And then they got to figure out running back because if you're going to run the ball that much, you're going to need one. Yeah, yeah. So they so they're definitely drafting Blake <coughs> Corum at 37. Oh, Blake Corum would be so good. Blake Corum at four, at 37. Blake Corum is a very um, he's a very Austin Eckler type of running back, actually. I don't know. So when Pete Carroll uh, went from USC to Seattle way back, way before we were even analysts, back in the late '90s, I remember the jokes are in my. I remember thinking in my head like, oh, he's just he's going to sign all the USC guys, and he didn't. At the like, he signed Mike Williams, and I, I don't think he got all of his Taylor USC Mays. guys. Did he get did, after did the didn't fact? Didn't draft though. Taylor Rays? I don't think he drafted him. Didn't he? Cincinnati did, didn't they? Ah, oh, you're right. But he ended up with him, right? But we, but that was like the jokes, like, "Oh, Pete's going to yeah, draft Taylor no, Mays didn't. at nine or something," you know. He didn't actually draft. He didn't go crazy guys. on USC players. Is my point? Yeah. What is is Harbaugh that guy? Like he's over there. He's the guy that's. So the other here's the other thing. Pete Carroll also, I think, came out and said Mark Sanchez declaring early was a mistake. The 49ers drafted Taylor Mays. 49ers did. Yeah. He also has this like people think he ran a four two because it was unofficial, and then they made it like four 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 or right. something. Anyway. Pete Carroll came out and was very honest about Mark Sanchez when he came out early back in the day. And it was, it was very realistic. And then he went out and he didn't just sign all the USC guys. He kind of shat over Mark Sanchez, if I remember rightly. Yes. Like everyone was expecting him to big him up. And, and he was sort of actually like, yeah, he's not even close to ready. All the coaches who seemed to do that, because I remember Brian Kelly did the same thing to Deshaun Kaiser. All the coaches are... Well, you don't. Uh, Jim do that. Mora may have said the same thing about Josh Rosen. Right. I'm just saying, all the coaches who came out and told the truth about their guys were right. Yeah. I mean, you don't say something like that unless it's true. <laughs> like you're yeah. certain. Why would you like? You're not taking that kind of shot unless it's really my, blatant. My point in all this is Jim Harbaugh has come out and said that JJ McCarthy is the best player in the draft. Right. Is Jim Harbaugh the type of guy that's gonna be like, Ah, give me. I'm getting all go blue. Let's go. go blue. We're loaded up on our national championship team. Get the give me the offensive line back together. Get Corum running the ball. I just hope that's not. It, remember the Lions draft a couple of years ago, where it felt like they were trying to instill the run game, mm-hmm. and their draft was like Frank Ragnow at center, which was fine. But everything after that went running back, carry on Johnson. They drafted a fullback. They drafted a run stopping linebacker. Everything was that. Yeah. If the Chargers go like tackle, they go alts. They go Blake Corum. They go run blocking tight ends. They go nose tackle, run stopper. I, I just don't know if I want to go down that path, but I could actually see it. I mean, if you're yeah, if you're implementing a Greg Roman type of offense, you are presumably going to have quite a run focused draft or, or off season generally. Like you are going to be trying to get bigger, stronger, tougher, and you're going to want a running back from somewhere because you probably don't have one at the moment. All right. Anything else specific about the Chargers? I want playmakers. I want speed. What type of running back do they want? Down, I mean, they're gonna they they run power counter, Roman. They're running. right, but even that, like, what type of running back do you want for that these days? Because this is the thing: the run it, game has changed in today's NFL. Where I even for a power type of scheme, like even for a gap type of scheme, I actually think you still want explosive speedsters. Yeah, of course. Like I, you don't, I don't want think there's a Derrick Henry looking people. Yeah, there's not like a. Specific type. I think some. I think some guys just with running backs. It's not about a size thing. You always have to be. You always have to have a good vision. You always have to be shifty. You always want big playability, and you always want. And you always want to like be able to create yards after contact. Mm-hmm. I think the difference is some guys are just naturally more conducive to like one cut downhill style of zone. Other guys are. You have to be a little bit more patient setting up blocks in a gap scheme. To me, those are the traits. It's less about this dude's two thirty. This dude's two ten. That type of thing. So they're probably not drafting Jonathan Brooks on the basis that he's coming off a knee injury. Yeah. Even though he might be running back one. Um, who would be your guy in the draft? 
You're asking me about running backs yeah. in February. Yes, I am. I haven't done my, my, my running back work. Trey Benson would you, be great for them. Trey, I, I, I thought you were going there. I, I also, you, you, listed, like, you like Estime. I do. I like From Estime Notre Dame. You also listed a bunch of attributes that frankly defined Will Shipley. Vision, shifty. Yeah. Will Shipley from Clemson. Get that man in that offense. Watch him cook. I like it. I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad that you've done some running back work. I feel, I feel dirty if I start scouting running backs before other positions are completed, before I've done my work at the other positions extensively. Drew in the chat is saying, uh, Blake Corm is not an explosive speedster. Well, he's explosive. He's not a speedster. Um, he's, I, was not, I wasn't suggesting that he is. He's just a good all-around running back. He's extremely explosive, but tops out quite quickly. Yeah. Like, he's, he's got an incredible burst and then, like, hits the rev limiter really fast. Who's that? That's somebody. Um, but also, by the way, That's somebody I could... Quorum 2022 and 2023 are different players coming off a knee injury. So Oh, his athleticism. Let me pull out the athleticism score. I think it, do it. Do I it. Think it tells that story about the So the, the big question, if you're, if you're analyzing Blake Corum, is, is, is 2023 the guy we are getting in future? Like, did the knee injury permanently damage him as an, as an explosive playmaker? Or is he a player that's just taking a year to get back to where he was, which is insanely explosive? Yeah, at the percentile, we had him in the 94th percentile in 2021. Okay. He was in the 75th percentile in 22 and 62nd percentile in right. 23. So his athleticism score has gone down. Um, max speed has gone down. What he's topped out at, yeah. We have a twenty point. Uh, we're in like a slightly different scale. What we use from what people hear from NGS, but his max speeds have gone down a little bit the last couple of years as well. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think you just need to ask yourself the question as a team: like, is he? Was this permanent, or is this just a year coming back from injury? All right. Have we done enough to solve to fix the Chargers? Yeah, we cut a bunch of players. We drafted them, probably Malik Neighbors at five. Uh, we gave them a selection of running backs to draft, and we're giving them linemen on in like the second and third round, right? Yeah, we're, that we're, all sounds pretty good. Those, yeah. Keep Derwin. They're another one of those teams that's primed to just be better on defense, just by scheme change. Sure. They're just gonna like the Vikings this year, just by scheme change, just by reshuffling some things, that they have a chance to just be better. So. AFC West is done. Easy. Yikes. We're halfway through this thing. NFC West. Where are we going? Arizona Cardinals. We have four more teams. We're seven-eighths of the way through the NFL, theoretically. South comes on Wednesday. All right, Arizona Cardinals. What are we doing in Arizona? Picking Uh, at four overall here. Yeah. Wow, have we got a lot of picks. <laughs> yes. One, two, three, four, up. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen draft picks. So when we say when we're talking about the Broncos and the Raiders and we say let's reset, like let's let's look to next year. Arizona is kind of the the template for this thing. Yeah. Six of which are in the first ninety picks. They have six um five in yeah, six in the first ninety. Yeah, you're right. Four twenty six. Yeah. Three out of the first 35. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of opportunity. A lot of drafts capital we got working here. Arizona was uniquely positioned last year to really punt on their season because they knew they were missing Kyler Murray. If and they this is, didn't like, have that, yeah. they probably wouldn't have gone this extreme. But now that it's like, all right, we're in a good spot. But yeah, and they, have, and they have an incredible amount of draft capital. Even when you consider they kind of got hosed <coughs> by the fact that the Texans were wildly better than everybody thought they would be. Oh, that like, Texans pick easily could have been top 10. Yeah, 15. like these yeah. picks at the start of the season were sort of betting favored to be one and two overall. And instead they end up with four and 27, which is still really good, but... Could have been so much better. Um, and then they have Marquise Brown as their biggest name, free agent. Um, and a ton of cap space. So I feel like, yeah, and a ton of cap space. So I feel like this is, first off, when you have this much draft capital, are they in the trade down market at four, like they were last year? So they, they had pick three, they traded down to what, 12 with, with Houston, and then back up to six. Right. And part of the reason why it was so great for Arizona is like they were going to pick Paris Johnson, their first round tackle, at three. And then they got all these extra draft picks and still got him at six, which was awesome. Are they still in the market to do that again? Or do you just take Marvin Harrison Jr. at four or whoever you like the best at four? Let's say Marvin Harrison. And then maybe the next four or five picks are all on the defensive side of the ball. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it depends how those first three picks go. Um, I number one, the que- if quarterback goes one, two, three, the question will be, do you trade? Can you, a can you get a trade down? And if you can, do you value that more than picking Marvin Harrison Jr. at number four? Uh, Reminds me of 2021, where there were three quarterbacks at the top, and then it went Kyle Pitts, Jamar Chase, uh, Jalen Waddle, Panay Sewell. Micah Parsons was in that draft, Patrick Sertan, right? And we said, if you're going to trade down, don't trade down so far that you don't get a blue, you don't get a blue right. chip. Is that the question Arizona's asking right here? How far can you trade down and still get – like, if they have a similar grade on Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and somebody wants to come up and get one of those guys, yeah. you trade down to six or seven and still get one of the, can you still get one of those guys and, and feel good about it? And then alternatively, Marvin Harrison Jr. gets picked at three and all of a sudden QB3 is available where you're picking. That probably makes it a lot easier to trade down. And True. the guy that you probably would have coveted the most in Harrison Jr. is already gone. So that makes that decision a lot easier if that's the way it works out. So, so I'm having deals on the table with Atlanta, Minnesota, Denver, or the Raiders if they're, if they're interested in getting to four if, if things fall certain. Right. If QB3 is still on the board at pick number four and those guys are interested in that player – the Cardinals should absolutely be looking to try and make that deal happen, particularly if it's you know the higher up that pick is, the better. Like if if Atlanta is willing to make that deal and you're only dropping to eight, no brainer. So I really want to come away with one of those two receivers. Marquise Brown's a free agent, probably not bringing him back. Michael Wilson emerged as a nice little two last year, two potential. Give me that wide receiver one. I want Neighbors or Marvin Harrison. And I put a Dunze into that category as well. Like I don't see any reason he can't be in that group. So we have to come away with one of the top receivers. If I could still flip it for more picks, great. And then let's say we're picking it. Well, then we're picking at 27, 35, 66, 71, and 90. Um, defensive side of the ball needs a lot of help. So that's probably the route to go there. Late first, I think the you know the cornerback market similar to some other teams. I don't know if some of the top like four or five of the top corners might be gone there by 27. That's a little risky to the way they're positioned they might miss out on some of the top corners i'm a little concerned about that but defensive line depth they need it all they've also got six day three picks in a year where we keep saying you don't want day three picks i wonder how much flexibility that gives them to move around with some of these day one and two picks like yeah. can they package some of those picks that they probably don't want anyway and move around you know in the first couple of rounds and maybe get five spots higher than they were starting with um, I see Chop Robinson as high as 20, uh, up at 29 right now on the, um, the most recent consensus board that I looked at. If I could get a receiver high, maybe a corner with my second first, and then like a Chop Robinson at 35 if he's still there. Chop Robinson's your guy. You've mentioned him for like every – I'm looking at Ed. I'm, 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 he's Ed the edge that's, that's like round one, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's I've the, guy, he's the guy this year. He's the guy. There's always a guy that get, gets drafted by every team. Who else could I make up? <laughs> Byron Murphy? I don't know if Murphy really goes as high as people are saying. Okay. He could be there late first and into the second. Braylon Trice? Braylon Trice? Oh, yeah. There's my second tier of, of edge. I really want to give everybody Austin Booker. Yeah. In Kansas. He's up to 104 on the consensus board. 75 in PFF's board. Yeah. He should be... He might be in the 60s or 70s at the end of the day. He'll be he'll be higher. I want Austin Booker from Kansas for everybody. Um, also want the Murphy brothers for everybody. The Murphy at, brothers from UCLA, Gabriel and Grayson. Where else are we going with Arizona here? Uh, I mean, they need, as you said, pretty much everything on defense. Like I think if you draft one of the top receivers, and now you have either Harrison, Odunze, Neighbors, Michael Wilson. Uh, Trey McBride, remember a tight end who was a beast once they started feeding him the ball. You still yeah, got Rondale nice Moore, combo. Greg nice Dorch. Combo. Like, you have a pretty good receiving core at that point. So I think you're good there. James Conner in the backfield, Kyla Murray. Um, the offensive line is pretty decent. You need probably a starting guard from somewhere. But outside of that, it's all defense. Like, you've got very little on defense. I can come away with uh, Chris Abrams Drain from Missouri. He's uh, projected in the 70s. We can get him at corner. I think we double up at corner if we can. Okay. Give me one of those first-rounders that's going to fall. 
And they're in a classic situation. People are going to scream, well, they drafted Garrett Williams last year. And they did, but, like, Garrett Williams coming off the injury that he was coming off in the third third? round. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's that's one of those classic picks where Garrett Williams should not prevent you drafting anybody this year, right? If Garrett Williams recovers from his injury and looks like the player that he potentially could have been before injury, it's a bonus. But you don't say, no, we cannot block the path of Garrett Williams to playing time by drafting somebody that is a better prospect than he is this year. That would be insane. Who's this person that's saying that you can't draft a corner because they drafted Garrett Williams? You just made somebody up. Every year. You're arguing against yourself. Every year, people talk about the guys they drafted last year in the mid rounds as somebody that's going to step forward into playing time and therefore be good and good, like, they still need that's two corners. why you can't draft somebody this year you still need to um and then again defensive line wise they've um i mean they've got the barbarian as a pass rusher they got zavin collins who you know they, they experimented with what cameron thomas didn't necessarily develop what what are, just what a pass rushing group you've got you've got the barbarian and an, and an off the ball linebacker yeah so i mean that's the other place they could potentially double up with chop no yeah. braylon trice i do think could be a really nice fit I mean, so again you can't necessarily rely on this even though he's a second round pick this time not a third but bj ojulari could step forward and be a bigger impact playmaker for them um the great Victor Dimakeji is still there. Oh, you still love him, yeah. Love, love Victor. They could be in the Darius Robinson spot at 27, Missouri uh, edge defender. Again, I don't know if he – I don't know where he tests if he has one of those Trayvon Walker um, – Tyree Wilson didn't necessarily test, but the perception was he was that level of athlete. I don't right. know if Robinson ends up with that type of rise into the top 10 to 15, but he could be that late first potential as well. And he's got that inside-outside ability with Arizona needs – both of those things. Yeah, they do. They need interior guys as well. Um, anywhere from a free agency standpoint that you would look. Again, offensively, I think they could use upgrades on the offensive line, but theoretically they're all pretty much locked up as far as DJ Humphreys at left tackle, Will Hernandez in the last year of his contract at guard. They could use depth there, but I would probably look to the draft for would, the line. They could be a playmaker – for one of the big sort of impact defensive linemen in free agency, uh, if, whichever ones make it to the open market. Like, if Justin Matabike yeah. actually hits the market, that would make sense for Arizona. They've got the money to make it happen. He fills a position of need, and it wouldn't, it, timeline wise, it makes sense. He's a young player ascending, coming off a career year. Like, he would be a good addition to them. They're another team, we mentioned the Brown strategy last year, which involved bringing in Maurice Hurst. I would go, you know, be in that world, Maurice Hurst. You mentioned Javon Kinlaw for another team Mm -hmm. somewhere as like a buy low candidate to add depth. Shelby Harris, another Browns late signing, you know, just to come in and add depth. I mean, Arizona needs all of that. They need this combination of getting younger and stitching it together with the productive one-year contract types at the end. Uh, Marcus Davenport's another guy. If if he's officially out there, I would buy low on Marcus Davenport any any team that needs defensive line help i would i would play that game for sure i also tier tart is another player that yes there's there's some red flags you know the titans basically got rid of him randomly because they were fed up with him um but he was picked up there were a couple of teams that were claiming him as well like he's still only 26 years old i think um i mean he could make an impact for a team that's got nobody stopping him getting to playing time all right, have we fixed the Cardinals? Yeah. That's a lot of options. We, because they have so many draft picks, we mentioned more players, I think, for anyone else. It's a lot of draft picks. For any other team. I Cardinals also, I mean, fixed. they should be using all of those day three picks to either move around or get into next year again. Like, if they can flip those for future picks, I mean, they could. That's the kind of draft capital hall that just lets you do a lot of things. You're right. So, listen, the Eagles had like a three year run. I was. A three-year run where they kept having two first-round picks and they just kind of like yeah. kept it going, right? And it gives you, it gave them the flexibility to trade for AJ Brown one with one of them, and then also draft Jordan Davis a couple years ago. Right. When you when you get to that position of power, because teams discount future picks, you can always remain in that position of power. You can always, and uh, in, in Arizona has enough picks to pick some. Pick some players, but also be in a position of power next year. I'm, I'm with you as well to continue to play that game. And in a, it, like it's, if you're one of those teams where you're drafting and um, 
like you just don't like where you are we're in the fourth round our picks coming up we don't like anybody on the board right now right we think everybody is at least a round two you know to uh, I mean, if they're not a blue or a green on here i'm trading down that's what i mean right like if you're working any kind of system right whether you're using the model or just whatever you come to if you're sitting there like in the fourth round you don't love where your pick is then try and trade to next year like we'll take even the equivalent fourth round pick next year for you know to, to get out of this pick all right cardinals fixed let's go los angeles rams next up on the board for the first time since 2016 the los angeles rams will work on thursday night they're actually going to work they're going to have to do something in the house in the house in presumably the house. in the house maybe they're going to be maybe the house was just there because they you know they weren't really working well or are they going to get a better house now that they've they're actually going to do things or, or they're going to be in the office they're probably going to go to the office because it's this is serious they have a first round pick mm. Right now, first time since 2016, uh, Rams coming off of just a fantastic season. Uh, when we when we're doing all these exercises, we're we're using depth charts. We're, it's, it's an on paper discussion, and the Rams were one of the most fascinating on paper teams last year because they still had Matthew Stafford and Cooper Cup and Aaron Donald, and literally the rest of the team was like Senior Bowl and Shrine Bowl guys within the last two years. I mean, for the most part, I mean, it was just it was young young team mm -hmm. but you get the puka nakua breakout you get the kobe uh kobe turner breakout and all of a sudden and then the stars played like stars you know cooper cup was hurt but um boom there they are a playoff team so now the rams they've reset the, the salary cap situation they could not play in free agency the last couple of years after going hashtag all in and here we go the rams are back to play in the offseason games. Yeah, they got camp space and they got draft picks. This is a whole new world for the Los Angeles Rams. Um, now, most of those draft picks are still day three, but still, they do have a first rounder, they have a second rounder, and they have two third rounders. So they, they basically don't have day... Like they've, got, they've got four picks in the first three rounds and then a whole bunch How of day How many do picks. they have total? They had seven, 12, 11. 11. 11 total picks. Yeah. And so, uh, three seventh round comp picks. It looks like right and cap space to play with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're they're players in in the entire off season, and they kind of need to be because as much as they were good last year and um, dramatically better than I think people expected, still a lot of holes in this roster. Um, so starting on the offensive side of the ball, they're going to lose two starting offensive linemen, Colvin Shelton and Kevin Dotson. It looks like. Um, I know Dotson, definitely one of the more coveted, should be on our list, one of the more coveted guards. Well, again, preface it with, I don't know if the NFL feels the same way as us, but we did have him as the number two graded guard last year. Breakout season with the Rams. As we said with other teams, if you could bring him back on the cheap because we like him more than the NFL does, do it. Yeah. Um, they've also, by the way, I think already re-signed Demarcus Robinson. They brought Demarcus Robinson back for like five or six million a year. There's some weird uh, there's a hilarious and slightly strange infatuation with demarcus robinson going on on this team well he was awesome last year but he was fantastic last no year. he wasn't he was good he was last force year. fed the ball in the red zone last year that's for right. some reason that's right which didn't make any sense at the time doesn't make any sense later and yet they've been like you know what we need to go get demarcus robinson back that man was a playmaker this is why you think it's easy to sit in this squeaky chair you think it's easy to sit in this chair Analyze all 32 teams, uh -huh. have good, strong, aggressive takes, be right all the time. Because sitting in this chair the last couple of years, if you, if you had told me Demarcus Robinson would be far better and more productive than Allen Robinson, yeah. I would wouldn't say that's crazy town. Wouldn't have made any sense. Crazy. All Allen Robinson needed was a good quarterback. Hadn't had one since middle school. Finally got one and then played terribly. Then got worse. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a good quarterback actually broke Allen Robinson. He's only capable of playing with terrible quarterbacks. Yeah, I'm used to watching the ball sail over my head. Yeah. I mean, Kenny Pickett's probably the second best quarterback he's ever played with behind Matthew Stafford, <laughs> and his production has been at an all-time low. Yeah. But Demarcus Robinson, solid. It's been good. Yeah, but solid in a way that feels like you could do that with any receiver in the world. You know, like if you just started feeding any receiver in the game the targets that he had in the red zone last year, they're probably getting 400 yards and four touchdowns. I still think, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty cheap deal. Demarcus Robinson, Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup. I, I do think they might still be in, uh, let's add to the receiver core market. Yeah, I mean, I, they're primed for just draft a guy in the third and see if he can come in and make an impact, you know? 
Yeah, they could do that. Your boy Jamari Thrash. Yes. Jamari Thrash would be a good fit. That would be a good one. For the Rams. I would like that a lot. Or um, uh, Roman Wilson. Or Roman Wilson. Yeah, that'd be, so, so let's, get, let's get a mid-round receiver in or there. Javon Baker, the UCF receiver. Yeah. That would be a good one, too. They're all in play. All in play. They're all in play. Uh, what about a pick 19 for the Rams? Uh, another center needy team. Are they uh, JPJ first round option? Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, the center out of Oregon. Yeah, they could. I mean, they have. They're one of those teams that could go in a variety of different directions at this pick. Like they have need at cornerback. They have need in the offensive line. They have need at. Um, I don't know what they value in the first round. Nobody does. Their last two first round picks were a QB and a running back. I mean, twenty sixteen. Yeah. It's 2024. Gurley, yeah. Goff in 16, Gurley in 15. Yeah. Donald a long and, time ago. Aaron Donald was the third to last first-round pick for the Rams. The last first-round pick that the Rams used on a player in the draft predates the Trump presidency. Amazing. That's a long, long time who ago. The, who was the tackle that went at two the year, Donald? The, I always say J- Jason Smith was the 2009 Number two overall failed tackle. Oh, it was Greg Robinson. Yeah. So the last four first round picks were Goff, Gurley, Donald, and Greg Robinson. The mix back. Twenty fourteen. It was a while ago. So I don't know what they covet. I do I will say, um, the edge uh, edge defender, you know, Byron Young played a lot last year, but they could definitely use help there, and I don't know where where the board ends up falling here. Anything to stop Michael Hoyt playing on the edge. Is a positive thing. In my we need opinion. him playing a little more Sam, a little more. I mean, honestly, into coverage. I, with all due respect to Michael Hoyt, I kind of feel like you want him playing on the bench as much as possible. But whatever you stop, you need to have him not playing edge rusher, running downfield, covering guys from the slot. Latu verse, they fall to nineteen. Are they available? I don't know if they are. Yeah, I think edge rusher is in play. I think corner is in play. I think offensive line is in play. I, I, I think they're actually in a pretty nice spot of being able to just sort of sit there and see how the draft pans out and then grab the, your favorite player at your position of need. I think you're right on all of those. Uh, left tackle, could definitely use a left tackle. Definitely could use a starting corner. I think corner corner and edge should be two top priorities this offseason for the Rams. Mm-hmm. Um, do they want to play aggressively in the corner market? Do they want to play the Legereus need game at corner if he's available? It's it's a weird off season for them because they're they're not the same as the Giants a year ago, right? For the simple fundamental reason that instead of Daniel Jones, they have Matthew Stafford and Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua. Like and it's a different dynamic. Stafford, by the way, playing the best ball of his career. Right, but it is, I think, slightly similar in terms of it's it's a very unstable bit of success that they just enjoyed like it didn't make sense on paper you look at what they did last year and you're like that offensive line was terrible on paper and somehow played much better than it looked like it should and you start looking at this roster and you're like there's a lot of bad players expected to play significant playing time so I they I think just they need to be a bit careful with the way they approach this offseason they can't go crazy and sort of pretend that they're you know right there on the cusp and they just need a big splash play or whatever they still need to do this the right way yeah i think the difference with it i don't like the giants comparison because of like the the foundation is stronger yeah and a lot of it is what i just said i know that and because what you said uh, they're young players they've got a, a plethora of young players who can develop and then you add you sprinkle in the splash play as a luxurious need type or sign kendall fuller like get a big name corner draft another corner um, add another slew of draft picks in there, and all of a sudden, yeah, the, the Rams are in business here. So I think they're close. I think they're closer because they used they used a reset year to make the playoffs, but I, th- I think it was real because they hit on Puka Nakua and, and what he was able to do, and they did it with Cooper Cup largely injured. Like, they're, they're pretty well set up, I think. Eh, That's I how mean, I see it. I think, that the, I think that it's just more fragile than that. Like... If it's a, it's a much more stable foundation than the Giants because they're strong in the right areas. But, like, the offensive line could easily collapse next year and be what it was, what it looked like it was on paper heading into the season. I mean, they could – like, if they, if they upgraded four starters or three starters this offseason, it wouldn't be crazy, you know? And, like, that's a pretty significant 
factor in terms of how good your team is going to be next year. And then you need to go and like attack defense. So, yeah, like it's not they're in a better position than the Giants. But I think the caution would still be that like that's just not assume that this is a playoff caliber team next year because it was this year another team that could use defensive line depth you got Aaron Donald Kobe Turner Bobby Brown on the defensive interior but I think I think edge both uh play in the free agent game and potentially in the draft got to attack that position corner I think might be the biggest need yeah on this team um and then those two starting spots center and guard uh try to bring back Kevin Dotson and stitch it together at center left tackle to the other one Larrick Jackson and Joe Nopum battling for that spot. I think you could use an upgrade there. Again, I, I, I think the Rams are going to be more aggressive, obviously, now that they have cap space and they're not just trying to reset the whole roster. Jonah Williams potentially in, involved there. Tyron Smith, do they play in that world for a, a year or two? I also kind of wonder if they go crazy now that they have a first-round draft pick and trade up with it. <laughs> yeah, We're actually in play at the top of the draft. Let's go all the way. I mean, there's also part of the reason why they traded the first round pick is because they they studied it and they're like, well, if we're picking it in the 20s, we're better off having a veteran plus yeah. the contract. They might still believe that, right? So they might take 19 and and keep trading down and accumulating more picks, or they flip it for a veteran somewhere. Yeah, it felt like a year ago actually when you were on the Sloan panel with um, Kevin Demoff. It it felt like listening to him sort of articulate the dynamics around their strategy that they they felt that there was an edge towards that strategy but that it had kind of reached the end of its lifespan and now either everyone else is catching up to the same idea or it's simply time to find the next edge yeah it doesn't feel like they're going to do the same thing over again just because they have first round picks again um i feel like they're going to go in a different direction with that whether that's just use your pick or whether that's actually trade with it i believe it was last year i think eight teams didn't have a first round pick it was some kind yeah, of record right so when so when you talk about they lost that edge like yeah other teams started doing that they right. traded for Tyree Kill and, and he, kept, he was and, sort of very specific in articulating look things like that are only an edge as long as you're the first person doing it and nobody right. else is doing it now one half when literally a quarter of the league is doing it it's no longer you're no longer stealing a march in everybody so you got to do something else or are they the team that calls Denver from two hours ago for Patrick Sertan here, take my next two first. Maybe I don't think I don't know that they're. I mean, just last year in a re, in a rebuilding year, 2022, they were sub- allegedly offering two firsts for Brian Burns. Who, by the way, are they going to go get Brian Burns on the free agent market right now as well? All right, a lot of options for the Rams. Did we fix them? We gave them some options. Hmm. Is that good enough? Sure, I think it was good. Demoff approved. Damn off my, my my co-panelist at Sloan. I'll be back at Sloan later this week, either Friday or Saturday. I don't have my schedule yet. When am I going, guys? <laughs> Somebody let me know. I'm trying to make dinner plans in the North End. Yeah, North End, in Boston. San Francisco 49ers. We get the Niners and the Seahawks left here. San Francisco 49ers. Super Bowl losers. How are we going to get the I'm Niners? That. That's what they were. It's a descriptive term, you see. I, yeah. Let's go. How are we going to fix the San Francisco 49ers? We have Brock Purdy under contract. We do. Eating ramen noodles, rooming with multiple teammates. He's making no money the next couple of years. Golden opportunity for right. us to build the roster around him. And it's still, like, what is it, at least a year away from being able to get more money as well. Like, yeah. they can't, even if they wanted to, they couldn't give him a contract for yeah. another year. Spend all the money uh, around Brock Purdy. Brock. Meanwhile, Joe Montana's out there, like, still balling out with his mil- bil- millionaire, billionaire lifestyle. Like, he's got it made. He's, like, 60s. Brock Purdy's current quarterback. Yeah, win. Super Bowl caliber quarterback. Win four Super Bowls. Can't get any money. Yeah, Joe won four. Yeah. Brock's won zero. Yeah, he did that back in the 80s when there was no money. All right, what are we looking at for the Niners? Hmm. What are we looking at with the Niners? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. I just, they, I just they got a lot of up. draft picks. They don't have a lot of cap space. Um, they've actually – so they're not in a position where – they're not like the Chargers, right, where there's like four or five guys that they're probably going to get cut because they're, they actually save them a ton of money. But they do all of a sudden have a bunch of guys with a giant cap number in addition to Brock Purdy earning nothing. 
Yeah, it's it's the whole where you deploy the resources. So remember last year, I, I don't think we anticipated the Niners being huge free agency players. And then they go out and sign Javon Hargrave for a massive number. It's like, dude, they're already loaded on the defensive line. Yeah. And since that point, they traded for Chase Young and Randy Gregory, and they just kept going and going and going and almost got him there as far as the D-line goes. And then and now they have this Brandon Ayuk situation as well where they have to figure out his future. Ayuk might be a little upset with the team. I don't know. And Ayuk emerged this year as one of the best all-around receivers in the NFL. And I think it's a fair question. They already locked up Debo Samuel a couple of years ago. It's a fair question to say, who would you rather have, Ayuk or Samuel, especially with Debo, the way he's been used as a running back and the way he plays from an injury standpoint. I think that's a fair question if you're the Niners. Yeah, I mean, I spent all last season, all last offseason rather, saying teams should be on the phone offering their first-round draft pick for Brandon Ayuk. And maybe the 49ers would turn it down every time, but if you need a wide receiver – particularly a number one, you, you should make that phone call. Like, yeah. at least make them turn it down, right? If you are, you know, a team picking somewhere in the middle of the first round, you should absolutely pick up the phone call or pick up the phone, dial John Lynch, offer him your pick, and make him tell you no, right? And maybe he will, but you should – not doing that, I feel like, is just not doing your due diligence. It's not turning over every stone, et cetera. Um, I feel the same way this year. Like – People are going to be talking about T. Higgins with the franchise tag. I think Brandon Ayuk is a better player than T. Higgins and certainly more versatile. So if you're in need of wide receiver and you don't pick in the top you know, 10 where you're going to get a shot of one of those top guys, do the same thing. Force them to make that decision. And if Ayuk is getting you know, a little bit more upset, maybe he's more inclined to agitate for that and help you out by saying, Hey, they, you know, whatever team is interested in me, I actually want to go there now. So the two things at play here is I I don't know. Do you have enough money to pay Brandon Ayuk in a year? Probably. So you look at the, they they are this fascinating, remember we we were sort of saying when you get a quarterback, the quarterback takes up the, the biggest chunk of your salary cap and then you have X number of, X number more big money contracts, right? Yeah. Four or five, whatever that is that you can give out. Well, cap number this year the 49ers have five players with a salary cap number of at least $22 million. George Kittle, Fred Warner, Eric Armstead, Debo Samuel, and Trent Williams. Trent's is all the way up at $31.5 million. So five guys essentially with the monster contract. But then they've got five more that are over $10 million. Uh, Traverius Ward, Javon Hargrave, Nick Bosa, Christian McCaffrey, and Brandon Ayuk. So... Ayuk right now is getting paid basically half what Debo Samuel is, or at least in terms of salary cap. It's half the cap hit. So if you assume this is the last... Getting paid his fifth-year option here. Right. If you assume that this is the last year, that that's going to happen. Next year, you're going to have to put something together similar to Debo. That's okay as long as you're budgeting one of those other deals in that $20 million bracket going away. Yeah. Which it could. Like if this is the last year of Trent Williams, for example, or if Eric Armstead can be moved on from then maybe that frees up that money. But they're, like, that's the game they're playing. In addition to, at some point, Brock Purdy's contract is coming down the pipe. So the thing that the Niners did a couple of years ago, which I loved at the time, and let's, let's rehash it, they drafted DeForest Buckner in the first round, got four years out of him, and right before re-signing him, they traded him for a first-round pick. It was pick number 14. They drafted, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but they basically da- drafted his direct replacement in Javon mm-hmm. Kinlaw, Clearly, Kinlaw was not very good for his four years there. He's going to be a free agent now. They did not pick up his fifth-year option. He did not replace DeForest Buckner's production one-to-one. But you could still say it was the right move because you can't sign a Javon Hargrave without that freed-up money, right? You, you, if you weren't going to pay DeForest Buckner, so you freed up all that money and you got a first-round pick back. Are they in a similar position here with Ayuk where you say, we got four years of great service out of Ayuk, Now we're going to flip him for another first-round pick. Don't necessarily have to draft a receiver, but it could work out pretty well that way. And we're keeping the money free for other potential free agents and re-signings and Brock Purdy in a couple years, but also getting a younger, cheaper at receiver. Could you make the same play? Again, one for one, Javon Kinlaw did not replace DeForest Buckner. But maybe the money that you saved from DeForest Buckner allows you to have Christian McCaffrey on the roster, have Javon Hargrave on the roster, it helps in other places. So that's to me, that's one of the options that they have here. 
Ultimately, though, I probably just I, – I like IU for the long term in the system. In yeah, but the question becomes how many of those big deals can you carry at any given moment? Like you can – I, I, I would be ready to move on from – I would rather have IU three years from now than Debo Samuel, I think. I think that's where I'm at. Even though Debo is like – Style and – yeah, I, I love Debo. I just think that's going to run its course. Within the next couple of years. Maybe. Let him out and then keep Ayuk as my one. I, I mean, I think they are capable of doing pretty much anything that they want in terms of the the, the, the fact that they haven't paid um, Brock Purdy yet and won't for at least another year means they've got the, the creativity, they've got the flexibility to be able to keep uh, Brandon Ayuk or, you know, flip him or let him walk. But they, if this is all the, the kind of the difficult tightrope act of managing a roster if you like a contending roster so you know you could you could pay brandon Ayuk this offseason keep him there for the long term and then figure out which of those big contracts is going to be coming to its conclusion whether it's trent williams or eric armstead or whatever alternatively teams picking in the middle of the first round like if the indianapolis colts called up with pick 15 and said hey We'll give you pick 15 and maybe some other bells and whistles for Brandon Ayuk. Or if Jacksonville, with pick 17, made the same phone call. Like, there are trades, I think, that would be difficult to turn down for the 49ers if you were looking at this and saying, what is the most, what is the optimal strategy for this roster? Because that would enable you to get away before you have to pay him the big money. And you could do what they did with the Kinlaw Buckner thing, even though it didn't work, or a better example, maybe what the Vikings did with Stephon Diggs and Justin Jefferson. Yeah. Like you get rid of Stephon Diggs, you get the first round pick, use the first round pick on Justin Jefferson, you end up better and cheaper. I mean, there's a there's an argument that the 49ers could do that the, with Ayuk. The Ravens did it with Marquise Brown, but just not a like for like position, right? You got rid of Marquise Brown, got another first round pick, you got potentially an elite starting center in Tyler Linderbaum, basically, for him. Again, I like that strategy overall. I also, if I'm the Colts or Jags, now that you bring both of them up, I love that move for them as well Sure, to be the team on the receiving end of, of Brandon Ayuk. Um, if they did it to fit for 15, is Brock Bowers available there? And you got Bowers to, to add to Kittle and another tin cup weapon? I mean, there's... Or even if, like, even if he, like, who knows what the draft is going to look like by the time you get to that spot. But let's say it panned out this way where you flip um, Brandon Ayuk to Indy or Jacksonville and somehow Roma Dunsday is still on the board at that spot. Like, you, you trade in Brandon Ayuk and the contract that that team is going to have to pay him to get Roma Dunsday on the start of his rookie deal for a fraction of the cost. And maybe he's not as good. Maybe he will be. But... Those are the kinds of things that a front office could do for the long-term health of the roster to make sure that they have as much flexibility going forward as possible. No, I like it. Or they just pay him this offseason. Yeah, or you just pay him. I mean, so those are interesting decisions for the Niners. As you mentioned, I think a ton of draft picks. They got four in the top 100. Um, last two drafts from San Francisco, they got J.R. Brown last year in the third round. That was their first pick, pick 87. That was the only pick McCaffrey. or the only draft last year where all of the consensus, like, draft graders hated it the only draft but it, it's like the nature of it because you for, your first pick was 87 so that's like we talked about this during our draft recaps all the time nobody's grading on a curve and they're not saying how well did the Niners do relative to the picks they had even relative to the picks they had it was a weird draft. oh was it yeah I mean Jared Brown was the one guy that contributed a little bit and of course Jake Moody a kicker um, but even from 2022 their top pick there they didn't have a first that year Drake Jackson hasn't really panned out great to this point. Guys like Tyrion Davis-Price, Danny Gray, Spencer Burford has been a starter. So they've basically gotten two starting caliber players or two starters over the last two years if you don't include your kicker. Um, so this is kind of a, a big draft. And again, even the year before, Aaron, you know, Trey Lance, Aaron Banks, Trey Sermon, Ambry Thomas, not a ton. They did steal Hufanga that year. In other words, to future-proof this roster, this is a big draft for them, I think. They haven't gotten a ton of contribution with a lot of draft capital the last couple of years. Four picks in the top 100. Right. That's a good place to to fill many of the uh, 
potential problems, future problem spots here on the Niners. The big thing I think for this team is you look at the roster overall, it's really good. It's one of the top rosters in the NFL. The biggest question is like, is the offensive line actually sustainable at this level? Or do we, do we need to make some serious changes there? Because eventually the thing is going to collapse around us. Like, Trent, the line right now is Trent Williams, who's playing as well as any offensive lineman in the NFL since he got there, and four other guys who have various yeah. shades of, like, average to below average. In I don't think quality. our grades are wrong there. I, I mean, I, I just I trust the overall analysis of it. And I think maybe lost in the Brock Purdy conversation is, you know, we've made excuses for other players when they don't have great pass protection. He's Purdy's produced without great pass protection. I would rather improve that if I'm the Niners for sure yeah so I think I think tackles in play if they stick stick in the late first and again playing this Ayuk game like if they stole another first rounder in a trade somewhere tackle receiver they could get they could fill both of those spots in the first round potentially tackle and receiver right like and, we've done with other teams. and by the way as great as Trent Williams is he's 35 heading on 36 like at some point he's gonna reach the end you, I mean, we're reaching the point now where at the minimum you need to start planning for life beyond Trent Williams. So the other part is we could keep Ayuk and another team that's trench heavy, offensive and defensive line in this uh, defensive line because you know they want to have eight deep and Cleveland Farrell and Chase Young and Kevin Gibbons and Javon Kinlaw are all free agents. They, they have heavy investment in Nick Bosa, Javon Hargrave, Eric Armstead, but you want to get younger there. So we attack uh, – offensive and defensive line essentially from a depth perspective that's how we're drafted that sound good mm -hmm. if we're making the decision do you want to pay Ayuk or do you want to trade him if that opportunity like if you had pick 15 or you could pay him uh i mean it, it always depends what that trade looks like i mean the 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 eagles traded the what was that 20 18 something like that they a mid first round pick but they also traded a third rounder as well, and they picked up the contract. If I was San Francisco and I was able to get pick 16 and a third round pick and somebody else was going to pick up the tab for Ayuk's contract, I think I would probably take that deal and bank on my chances of being able to draft not a, not a Diggs to Jefferson replacement, but like a close enough yeah. replacement that I can lean on Debo, Kittle, uh, Christian McCaffrey, just other players. Again, I think those, I think those moves make sense over the course of time for the organization, right? Have get four good years out of a first round pick, get another first round pick for him. Over time, I do think that works because the money gets gets spent elsewhere. Um, anything else you would do with the Niners here? Um, I mean, I think they – I would like to see them invest pretty significantly in the offensive line across the board. So both draft guys, but also hit that, you know, mid-level free agent market where you can get starters that won't break the bank. All right. I like it. Michael Owenu? Michael Owenu. I mean, Robert Hunt would be interesting in that offense. He's already good. That feels like the kind of system that could propel him to the moon and make him look like an all-pro. I think a guy like Ezra Cleveland, too, even though he dropped off last year, is still probably better than Aaron Banks, right. who's there. Well, what I'm curious about, though, is I always talk about the year three, four breakout for offensive line. That They're in that – Colton McKivitz and Aaron Banks are, like, in that range when they should continue to progress. So just the experience could work for them mm -hmm. and make them better on paper. But – I'd look to all those potential upgrades, though. Niners fixed? Yeah. Winning the Super Bowl next year. Getting over the hump. Seattle Seahawks, team 32 out of 32, even though we've got eight more to go on Wednesday. For us, this is it. And we're driving to Indy. Got Prime Steakhouse. We got St. Elmo's this week. Got a big week in Indy, but one more piece of work here. Seattle Seahawks. Um, we've got three offensive linemen. Hitting free agency, three starters, Leonard Williams, who they just traded for, hitting free agency, and uh, a little reset here in Seattle with Mike McDonald coming in as head coach. What are we looking for with Seattle? Geno Smith. There's rumors about Geno Smith trades. Why? I don't know. I think he's their guy for at least the next year or two here. So. Yeah, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, so I question one is always, are they going to use the franchise tag? And if so, on whom? On any of those guys? Noah Fant, also a free agent. 
Yeah, What's the so. tight end tag? I don't. It's think like it's... twelve million or something. It's not much. Uh, yeah, it's one of those that's lower than the other positions, pretty significantly. I don't. I, I was getting questions on Seattle radio the other day about um, Will Disley maybe taking over for Noah Fant. He's. I mean, he's your blocking tight end. Tight end still going to be a need with Fant leaving. Franchise the Leonard tag is twelve point seven million yeah. for tight end, and just then, the lowest in the NFL outside of special teamers. So then they just started running back is slightly lower as well. Remind me, do you remember what they gave up for uh, Leonard Williams? Uh, no, but that so um, it was a second, right? Yeah. So Seattle doesn't have a second round pick, and that that trade just looks worse. Twenty twenty four second and a twenty twenty five fifth for half a season of Leonard Williams. Yes. That looks horrible right now. Right. So you almost, in the sunk cost fallacy world, basically have to franchise tag him, otherwise you look terrible. That's what I'm saying. Like, Leonard Leonard Williams... But it was a different... I mean, it wasn't Mike McDonald. Leonard Williams is a very good player. He's very consistent. He is not an impact player. His former teammate, Dexter Lawrence, with the Giants, is an impact, game-wrecking type of player. Leonard Williams is not that guy. You know, so that's uh, Chris Jones, game-wrecking impact player. Aaron Donald, of course. Williams isn't that guy. He's just he's really good and solid. Like right? if you if you let me have Leonard Williams for twelve million a year instead of twenty million a year, I'm in. The problem is that price tag for me. And then when you think about the second round pick, it's one of those when you're in the middle of the season, it's like oh yeah, we're gonna get this guy. We, it's a big hole in our defensive line. He's gonna help, and we're gonna make a run. And then you get to the off season, it's like wait, I'm missing a second. <laughs> I'm missing an entire second-round pick. It's a lot. I don't know if we uh, sunk cost that thing into a long-term deal with Williams, though. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it. it um, well, the alternative is you franchise tag. No, no, that's so much. It's not that much. I mean, you franchise tag him. It'll be as a. It's twenty-one, twenty-two million for a year. Yeah. You want to do that? I, I mean, I don't want to do that, but I, neither do I want to let him walk and look like an idiot because I gave up a second and a fifth round pick to do it. I think you got to look like an idiot. You have to look like an idiot? Yeah. I don't want to look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are. Jamal Adams, potential cut candidate at safety. Um, I like where we are at speaking receiver. Of, speaking of looking like an idiot. Yeah. That's one of the worst trades that's been made in recent memory. Uh, so a lot of their a lot of their money's locked up in Jamal Adams, Quandre Diggs, both of those guys are up over twenty. Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf. Again, I like the I'm good with the receiver money there. I love the foundation. I think Jackson Smith and Jake Bubb will be good in year two. Will be better in year two at least. Love that trio at receiver. I think you got to clean things up on the defensive side. Um, so McDonald, it, it's going to be interesting seeing what types of players he's coveting and, yeah. and where he wants to go. But and I think Adams, to me though. I think you can move on from Leonard Williams, say it's over, and move on from Jamal Adams. But a guy like Adams also becomes interesting with Mike McDonald coming in. It's like, what does what can Mike McDonald create from Jamal Adams, who, remember, at the start of his career was seen as this, like, jack, like not even jack-of-all-trades, a guy that could do it all at safety. He can play anywhere you want, from linebacker to cornerback, and make an impact everywhere. And then Seattle traded multiple first-round picks for him. And it's like, oh, no, he's just a disaster that can only play at linebacker and can't do that particularly well. Like, can does Mike McDonald look at him as a really intriguing reclamation project, given what we've seen from him earlier in his career? Or does he look at him the same way everybody else and goes, I can't make any use of this in my defense? Weird career arc, yeah, for Jamal Adams. Because uh, people questioned the trade at the time. Yeah, but that was that was when he was playing well too. Yes. Like if he had played at the same level that he played with the Jets, it, it'd be easier to justify it before the the drop off there. Yeah, again, there's there's seven million in cap in cap savings if he gets cut. Um, it, I, am, almost, I am with you though, is in intrigued with yeah. McDonald. And there's also almost twenty million in dead cap money if you get rid of. No, him. I know. I, I just wonder, like he might be looking at Jamal Adams the same way as everybody else. When you turn on the tape, you're like, this guy can't play anywhere at the moment like the closest he's i can battled injuries all i can do with him is hide him at linebacker and he's worse doing that than just a linebacker so what am i doing here or he looks at jamal adams and says look earlier in his career this guy could do everything like he can be my kyle hamilton in this defense if we get him fixed i don't know uh jordan brooks the other interesting one former first round pick that 
is a free agent for Seattle, and he's he showed flashes through the years. He's been inconsistent too, but at the same time, by our numbers, Roquan Smith was very inconsistent until he went to Baltimore. Patrick Queen rejuvenated his career, at least to a point, as a former first-round pick under McDonald. I wonder if they try to bring a Jordan Brooks back because he's a talented guy. He's just been, again, um, some coverage issues, pretty good against the run over the last couple of years. Could be another uh, – that's, that's the intrigue, I think, with Seattle. It's, it's like some reclamation projects on the current roster that could make the defense that much better. Yeah, and as much as corner is in a pretty good spot, like outside of corner, who can cover? Like they have two linebackers, whether they, if they bring back Jordan Brooks, coverage is his weakness. And then you have Bobby Wagner, who the older he gets, the weaker his coverage ability gets just yeah. through age and decline. Um, and then I'm, gonna you know, say, I'm, I'm curious to see how much the, the Michigan scheme, the Michigan Ravens scheme going across the NFL starts valuing linebackers. Yeah, and if it values them a lot, like where are Seattle getting their coverage linebackers from? Because right. they don't really have any at the moment. Where's their uh, draft? So they're picking at 16. They don't have that second round pick, but they have 78 and 81. Those are both third rounders, right? Um, just look at the mock draft simulator. Seven total picks. What are your thoughts on Seattle at 16? Patrick Queen, by the way, he was a free agent. Like, could bring Queen in. Yeah. That could be the guy. Could be the they guy. Bring in. Uh, Seattle does not have an, it's a, a lot of the places where we say teams have needs in the first round uh, that mesh with the where the draft board might be receiver corner and tackle Seattle's pretty set at all those spots right two good young corners receiver I mean you could always get younger but I don't think they're taking another first round receiver and they have two good young tackles and Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas so middle of the first round I mean are they is that a Brock Bowers potential landing spot if he's there at 16 for Seattle? Are they just going all uh, defensive line potentially? Uh, Byron Murphy on the defensive interior, especially if they let Leonard Williams walk, or um, they've invested a ton of second rounders and edge rushers over the last couple of years, but I don't know if they've actually hit. Boye Mafe did break out last year, but they could still use some help off the edge. Yeah. Um, let me give you a couple of uh, low price free agent linebackers, though, that can cover. Yeah, yeah, play that game. Willie Gay. Willie oh, Gay's I like Willie Gay, yeah. Free agent. Stupid athleticism. Now, they've often used him more as, like, spy athleticism as opposed to coverage athleticism, but I think he can do that as well. He makes some of the – I always expect him to grade well in coverage because he makes re some ridiculous plays. Yeah. Um, so maybe he just needs the right system. Um, not that the system he's been in hasn't been good, but anyway. And then Tyrell Dotson is the other one who stepped in, played for Buffalo last year with all their linebackers getting hurt and graded stupidly well. Um, again, he's sort of undersized, got some good athleticism. Like either one or both of those guys coming into that, uh, that linebacker core I think would make it dramatically more athletic and versatile in coverage. Maybe you keep Bobby Wagner around for you know veteran mentorship, et cetera. But for very little money, I think you would have – dramatically improved your ability to cover at that spot i like it you've, give, you've given some good answers here um seattle i'm going to go back to their first round pick um center evan brown hits free agency they did draft Oluwatimi from michigan last year he could potentially step in but they like every center needy team jackson powers johnson got to throw him into the mix there are there any other centers in the draft not in the first round okay not in the first round zach frazier from west virginia second round they don't have a second rounder. They don't have a second rounder. Don't have a second it's rounder. JPJ or bust. That's right. It's the only <laughs> place to go. Um, I think edge rush, though, too. Again, I, I don't know where Latu and Jared Verse, the guys that I actually like there, land. Dallas Turner. I think we mocked him to Seattle as a first rounder, but I think they should be in the edge market there for sure. We're both out on Dallas Turner. He's not an option. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would. We don't, we don't like it. Well, we'll see. Pending the combine. Combine matters. Pending the combine. In the model. Yeah. Combine matters in the model. You're combine matters the most for, if we're talking about project, I don't want to hear it, Waltz. Don't tell me, just watch the film. Combine actually does project to production for uh, edge, it matters. Corner, it matters. Tight end. Receiver a little. I mean, as long as you're, you're not telling me that you could go from out to in on Dallas Turner based on the combine? And by you, I mean the model. The model could, the, the way I... Um, uh, the way I implement the model, and I, which I just made up and just said, just give me 80th percentile players. <laughs> if I just said 80th or better, uh -huh. there's a chance he could get he to could the 80th jump percentile. jump the line. Yeah, he could, could combine. Because he's in the 60s right now. 
It's not. It could be he, I'm not out on him like I was out on Tyree Wilson. Like Tyree Wilson literally could have been an Olympic sprinter, and that it would. wouldn't have helped. <laughs> Trayvon Walker literally did that. Like had the best combine of all time. It you help. were. It's it's actually hilarious how anti Tyree Wilson you were, and yet still may not have been harsh enough. Based wasn't on what wasn't harsh enough in year one. It's like when I was the lowest of anybody on Laquan Treadwell, and apparently still wasn't low enough. One one twenty on my draft board was yeah, not low you, enough. We were trying Tyree to convince Wilson. you that one twenty on the board was like unreasonably silly, and actually, if you just put him there, it probably would have looked the best of anybody's, but like first round or not big board. The the workout stuff does matter here especially if you're on the cusp if you're on the borderline so we'll see right now i've got this run with everybody with average combine measurables right right so so everybody's on the same playing field so far Mm -hmm. uh what else do we have here what else are we doing uh so we overhaul linebacker um damian lewis is actually he's one of the guards that i've given other teams he's one of their free yeah so we've given them jpj at center but we still need both guards yeah, I'm not necessarily giving. I mean, I'd rather the edge rushers than JPJ uh, play. Well, then, then we need all three of the interior offensive linemen. Yeah, give me the guards and centers and free agency. I mean, it's the same thing. If you're if you need three starters in the offensive line, you need to hit it in both free agency and the draft. Like you can't you can't just pick and choose. So if you bring back, uh, if you bring back um, Damian Lewis, but also I mean, you could be shopping Tyler Biotish is out there. Connor Williams. But center, I mean, there's places to go. Coleman Shelton just got cut from the Rams, right? Yes. I mean, I would, yeah, I would try to shore things up on the offensive line, as always, prior to the draft as much as possible. Yeah. Um, creep back toward average, get solid players. They weren't great as a line last year, but they dealt with some injuries. They, If they can get a couple solid starters in there, at least get four out of five, feel pretty good about their tackles so far. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I like the playmaker situation for Geno Smith. I think you could always get a little bit younger at receiver, maybe not with high draft picks, but the middle rounds at receiver, again, might have uh, a nice group of options. If, uh, as DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, there's going to be a point where you're going to want to probably get rid of one of those guys. I mean, Lockett. Lockett especially. Yeah, at this future point proofing, in his looking for an heir apparent to Tyler Lockett, I think would make a lot of they sense. They did it with Smith and Jigba, but I think you keep playing that game. Yeah, and I don't know if they anticipate him being the like the heir to that spot or whether they're going to go in a different direction. But absolutely, like a mid-round pick to try and find Tyler Lockett's eventual successor makes a lot of sense. Cade Stover, the tight end from Ohio State, I like him as a potential third. If we're talking about Noah Fant is gone and Will Disley is going to come back as your blocking tight end. Um, I do think, I'm, I'm very again, I'm curious about the defense and McDonald and what he's doing, what he wants to value. I like the free agent linebacker idea for you, but I like a lot of youth on the defensive line as well. Is that it? Yeah. Did we do it? Mm Mm-hmm. We fixed three quarters of the league, and we will take care of the last eight teams on Wednesday. But for you and I, we're done. We did it. Fixing every team in five minutes. That's fun. Excellent. It's enjoyable. Done. Uh, 30MDS is the promo code for th- uh, 30% off any PFF subscription right now. 30MDS over at PFF.com. Go check that out. Uh, but for us, yeah, we're going to Indy. Do you have any uh, Do you have any big plans besides eating a lot of steaks and uh, St. Elmo's shrimps? That would be good, yeah. The, the uh, I don't – the shrimp thing I think is overrated because the cocktail sauce is horseradish, and I yeah. hate horseradish. I don't need that. I just – I like the shrimp itself. I don't have a problem. But I like the little – yeah, pinch of it. It's not the heat that bothers me. It's the like horseradish. It yeah. It's disgusting. Luckily, we get a bunch it of other stuff. Should be removed from the world at our secret PFF party at St. Elmo's. So yeah, big week, and then I'm going straight to uh, Sloan this weekend. I'll be on the panel, football panel, either Friday or Saturday. Still mm-hmm. looking for that schedule, guys. If you want to let me know. And when then I'm are you on. out the following week as well? Next, yeah. So I come home from Boston on Sunday. Right. And then Tuesday morning, I'm flying to Mexico. Tuesday morning. So we have a Monday show, and then you're out? (sighs) Do I have to work on Monday that week? Got to do it. Got to do it. Because then I only have to find people for two more shows. So we'll do a combine wrap-up show. Yeah, on the Monday. Perfect. I'll have to rerun. I don't know if I'll have the data in time to have a rerun model. (laughs) So we'll do a combine wrap-up show. Yeah, you're being much more coy on the model this year anyway, so that's not a problem. I'm trying to be coy, because, like, what if Tom wants it? I this week. Know. 
what if the other GMs are like, man, I need it, I need the model, part of my part of my process. I mean, it feels like you could still put out quite a lot of information to the public and still have the model to sell. No, of course, people, of course. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna like once we do rankings and mock drafts and stuff like that, the information will come out. You'll get you'll get information on who yeah. the best players are going to be. You'll get it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So I'll so I'll do that Monday show. Then I'm off to Mexico for a destination wedding. Destination wedding. Yes. Uh, somebody's asking, are we doing a live show from the Combine? From memory, we will not be doing anything live from the Combine. We might be doing some things live from the Combine. But there's been a, it's been a snafu when it comes to table allocation uh, in Radio Row, the media, whatever the hell they call that room with all the tables. Uh, we might not have one. Uh, or we might have to share some other persons. Or we might be recording the whole damn thing from an Airbnb at the moment, who knows? Can't wait to find out. I'll tell you what's happening, though. Wednesday, you will magically be in here fixing every team in the South. Mul yes. Multiple people in the chat have complained that I haven't even mentioned the Stade Francais try that I sent you. I sent you the that try. The guy running the length of the field and, like, kicked. Oh, that was amazing. That was a great play. Yeah, see? Even Steve saw it. It's a great play. That uh -huh. was outstanding. There you go. Done. What do you mean? So, people are... People were expecting about. me to mention that, like during the course of fixing a team. I'm not quite sure how even yeah. I would have gotten there, but we've mentioned it's it. tough to like get off course and ramble more than we usually do when we've got, you know, five minutes. I to think fix it's pretty easy, but usually my segues into rugby at least make tangential sense to yeah. what we're talking about. That one wouldn't have, so we had to bring it up at the end. All right, we got to hit the road. Yeah. We appreciate everybody. Thanks for everybody for tuning in, and uh, just stay tuned for more uh, for more content this week. Who knows where it's coming from in Indy? Content. All right. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you again on Wednesday with more PFF NFL podcast. <laughs>